Hello, and welcome to our second Climate Mastermind event. My name is Heather McDougall, CEO of the McDougall Program. I will be your moderator today. We are so excited to continue this very important discussion about what needs to be done to save our planet. The more I learn about this topic, the more I realize how important it is to get this message out to the world. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. We want to hear from you, so please type your questions in the Q&A section, and I will do my best to get to them all. We have two sessions today. We're going to have three short presentations this morning, and immediately following, we will have a Q&A session with our morning panelists. Then we have a break for about two hours, and we were back at it for an afternoon session, much like this morning. Please note this entire event is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. So please share this important day with family and friends. The planet is in trouble and needs our help. Thankfully, we have a message of hope, which is what we are all here to discuss today. I have three teenage boys and I wanna be able to look them in the eye and say I did everything I could to save our planet, which is why I have enjoyed, why I have joined this important mission with my father, our host today, and the person responsible for bringing this entire event together, Dr. John McDougall. Hi, Dad. Well, hi, Heather. Good to, good to have you. We're going to have a great day today and have a lot of fun together. You know, things have changed a lot since our first, uh, our first Mastermind presentation, which was uh, January 9th. Uh, we went from a, an administration that had complete denial as far as climate change is concerned to an administration in the United States where it's a number one topic, uh, climate change. And you know, they're gonna be paying a lot of attention to fossil fuels and transportation and conserving energy and trying to be carbon neutral over the next, oh, what, 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And do we have that long? But the thing that's being ignored is the importance of diet. Uh, diet has uh, an impact on the environment, which each individual can exercise themselves and the impact is overnight. You know, estimates are as high as the Lancet Commission said in March of 2020 that we could, by changing to a vegan diet, cut the carbon emissions by 50%. And some experts tell us that by switching from the standard Western diet to the kind of diet that I've been teaching for 44 years, that we can reduce the carbon, the amount of carbon in, in the atmosphere. Well, it's gonna take a while to do that but we can reduce our global warming gases by 80% overnight. You know, a lot of people out there are really frustrated because you know, they understand that we're in big trouble. I mean, heck, you and I have, have suffered climate change ourselves on a personal level. In 2017, both of us lost our homes and it's been you know, an interesting disruption. Some positive things have come out of it and of course some very negative things. But all around the world, people are experiencing drought, floods, hurricanes, you know, a general warming of the temperature. Now, I'm a lover of the oceans. Uh, I started going into the ocean when I was about 12 years old. And I've seen the change. I've seen the change in the number of fish. I've seen the change in the coral reefs. And that's, that's impacted me a lot. In fact, you know, as we've talked, Heather, uh, over the last few days, we've talked about some of the wonderful experiences that you and I and your brothers have had and we've had the great fortune to show your children the beauties of the ocean. And, you know, I hope you get a chance to take your children to the Galapagos and Cobras Islands and all over the world to see the beauty of the oceans. I hope it's still there. Well, you know, I have to take a, a very optimistic approach because if I listen to some people, I, I, I get so depressed. Uh, knowing that we have a card to play that's so powerful and that's the food. I mean, uh, the Livestock Long Shadow Report from the World Health Organization back in 2006 said that uh, the livestock industry accounts for 18% of the global warming gases. And the World Watch Institute, they reevaluated the figures from the World Health Organization. And they said over half the greenhouse gases are due to the livestock industry. And that card is not being played. I don't know why. You know, Al Gore didn't talk about it in his Inconvenient Truth. Uh, 
Greta Thunberg, she is a vegan, but she doesn't emphasize it enough. I mean, I think people are afraid uh, to confront others at their dinner plates, just too personal, more personal than politics, more personal than uh, almost anything I can think of. It must be the reason that people are afraid to say, hey, you need to change what you eat. And I'll give you the bottom line. People need to give up the animal foods, the animal products of all kinds. And we're not gonna teach anything but 100%. But following any, any amount of uh, this kind of change that we recommend, it's gonna be of value to you in your personal health, as well as the planet. So do what you can, but don't be surprised if uh, the message that comes from me and Heather, and hopefully some of our speakers is that, look, this is a, this is a crisis. We, we don't have time to, to, you know, to act slowly. We've got to get this solved overnight. And today, maybe you have beef steaks and pork chops and, you know, cheesecakes and hey, tomorrow, Tomorrow you can have oatmeal for breakfast, you can have bean burritos for dinner, you can have spaghetti and marinara sauce. It's just a simple change. And all you give up is bad health. And what you'll realize, you also give up bad taste. The kind of foods that we're asking people to give up are rather bland tasting or really disgusting. The only way most people can eat the kind of foods that are destroying their personal health, as well as the planet, is they have to cover them up with barbecue sauce, steak sauce, lots of salt. It's not our food. The human being is designed as a starch eater. Just to give you a, a direction on the diet that uh, I, I want to teach people, and, and our speakers are going to not address uh, directly, but kind of touch on. Uh, the diet that I recommend to people is a traditional diet of human beings. 99.99% of people who have walked this planet have lived on a starch-based diet. You can relate to the Asians living on a diet of 90% rice or the people of Central America, the Aztecs and the Mayans. They're the people of the corn. The breadbasket of the world, you remember that place? It went to the Middle East? That was the breadbasket of the world. Now bread is vilified. How did that happen? Well, you know, we've got the meat industry and the dairy industry to thank. And unfortunately, the medical business derives a tremendous amount of profit from sick people, and they have no reason to tell you to get healthy. But we're dealing with something more, more important than what I've dealt with for the last 44 years, which is curing your diabetes, your high blood pressure, your heart disease, your obesity, your bowel problems, more important than that. And that is that we're, we could, we're gonna save this planet. And uh, as our first speaker is gonna tell us, uh, there are a few options out there as far as saving the planet. Well, Heather, how do you feel about this? I mean, you're a young woman. You've got uh, children of, of teenage years. And boy, oh boy, I, you know, I'm almost, I'm, I've almost done my life. Uh, so the consequences as far as my personal self are, are not too great. You know, I'm in my mid-70s. But, uh, you know, I think about you and, and my seven grandchildren. It's worth it. The planet's worth saving. So as you started out saying, Heather, you know, tell everybody. And you want to tell them like I do, which is to get right in their face. Or you talking? I'm not like you. <laughs> I'm more I'm more subtle, but I think about it all the time. Like you said, I've got three teenage boys and hopefully grandchildren someday. So the health of this planet is so important, and I see changes occurring, and my my boys see it, and you know they're they're worried, and they want to know what they can do and and what sort of a difference they can make, and just what you said. Changing our diet is something everybody can do overnight. You don't need any money. You don't, you don't need anything. You just stop eating those foods. And it's something everyone has the power to do. And, and that's what I think is so great about this message and, and so important that my boys can do it. You know, their friends can do it. Everyone can make a difference. Right. Everybody can do it themselves. You first have to, you have to learn about it and then you have to have the will to change. Mm -hmm. It may be a personal level that you want to change because you want to look better and feel better and function better. But we're going to try and bring this to a higher level of concern. And that is, you know, planet Earth is going to be here. <laughs> the problem is, is the inhabitants won't. And as, as the, uh, the human species, I, I just assume we were around and we governed the planet in a, in a very positive, productive way, not in the destructive way that we've been doing. Well, I, when I, I just... Uh, to put things in perspective, in, in the 1970s, when I was, uh, I was in my 20s and 30s, uh, 
we could do something about it. It was really easy. And the messages were out there. You know, Nixon told us that uh, the planet was in trouble. Uh, Reagan, Reagan came out and told us that we needed to make changes in, in our fossil fuel industries or we're going we're gonna to perish. But nothing's happened. You know, since 1970, was that 50 years, nothing's happened. Well, you know, as I mentioned, we've got a new administration. We've got uh, governments around the world that are very well aware. And they've been much more progressive than the United States. But I, it's the role of the United States to lead the way. And uh, even though a couple of our guests today are from England, I didn't in any way want to suggest that uh, the people from the United Kingdom aren't going to be leading the way too. We also have a guest uh, from Berlin today. So we have an international conference. So, well, would you like to get on to our first speaker? Yes, I'm very excited. Uh, Let me tell you a little bit about him, unless you'd like to talk about it. Oh, go for it. All right, this is a professor. He's uh, Rupert Reed. And uh, when, I, when I told Don Forrester, who's one of the doctors who works for our program, that I had Rupert Reed on. He says, you gotta be kidding. This guy is so amazing. How'd you get him? Well, he's a, he's a, a, a very progressive guy to say the least. As a matter of fact, he's, he, he's out there breaking down walls. He's been uh, involved with the Green Party. He's also involved in, uh, in environmental extinction groups. And this is a man who really speaks his mind. He has a very clear message uh, and somewhat optimistic. But at the end of his presentation, I'm going to see if I can drag as much optimism out of him as possible. So let, let's go ahead and uh, hear about, excuse me, Rupert Reed. It's Rupert Reed, what I say, Richard, Rupert Reed. And uh, let's uh, hear what he has to say. Okay, here we go. The climate emergency that grips our world is different from other emergencies. Firstly, it's long. It's not something that just comes and goes. It's going to be with us basically permanently across all of our lives. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Secondly, it's a subset of a much broader and even more complex emergency, the ecological emergency. Climate is the symptom of a much deeper ailment. These emergencies are the defining problem of our times. They're sometimes called a wicked problem. Even that I think understates the issue. The very word problem may be problematic here. These emergencies are a tragedy. They come from tragic flaws in our system, possibly in our very selves, in our very being. They are a condition which is going to define us and the whole rest of our lives and the lives of our children. They are defining in that the only question that our children will really care about, the only question that they will ask us searchingly with utmost seriousness is, what did you do while there was still time to do something meaningful about this? These emergencies are defining of us. Furthermore, they are profoundly complex. There is no silver bullet to deal with these emergencies. In fact, there are very few bullets at all. I've come to the conclusion slowly and painfully over recent years that there is no bullet that in our situation, in this emergency, can save our civilization. What do I mean by that dramatic pronouncement? Three possibilities confront us. First possibility, that our civilization will be terminated with extreme prejudice, and that that will be it for us. This possibility can no longer be ruled out. It is possible. Second possibility, that our civilization will collapse, but a new civilization will emerge from the ashes. This is what I call the Phoenix scenario. Third and final possibility, that our civilization will transform. This is what I call the butterfly scenario. But please notice this, if our civilization does transform, 
it will be as different as a butterfly is from a caterpillar once it's transformed. Right now, our civilization is alarmingly like a caterpillar. It tromps through everything rapidly, without thought, converting it to waste. But our civilization could become a butterfly. We could live far more lightly on the earth. We could make our way of being far more beautiful. We could commit senseful acts of beauty. That could be our life. So three possibilities, but notice, whichever one of them comes to fruition, this civilization is finished. Because even if we achieve the third possibility, the butterfly scenario, what emerges will be so different from what we have that in no meaningful sense will it deserve to be called the same civilization. It will be as different as a butterfly is from a caterpillar or for that matter, from a pupa. When I talk about this, I notice that everybody loves the butterfly possibility, option three, and understandably so, obviously so. But I have to tell you this, we've left it so late. We have so little time. What we really needed was governments that were genuinely green in power 30, 40 years ago, after the early warnings of the environmental movement of the 60s and 70s. But that didn't happen. It's not five minutes to midnight. It's five minutes past midnight. We've left it so late that the butterfly scenario, while I still strongly believe that it is achievable, cannot be adjudged to be likely to be achieved. Option two, scenario two, the Phoenix scenario is much more likely and will involve much more suffering. So we need to aim for the butterfly scenario, but we need to be ready for collapse and for seeking to seed the Phoenix scenario, the Phoenix civilization that will then potentially, hopefully follow. What does this mean? Well, it means that we need to do everything. We need to transform everything. We need to do so in a way which is aiming at transformation without collapse, but is also ready to cope with collapse. We need to work at transforming, therefore, on multiple dimensions and multiple levels and in every meaningful way possible. While focusing our effort on those actions with the potentially highest rewards. So what are the implications of this? Any one dimensional approach to the emergency is wrong. Any approach that imagines holding onto the current paradigm is doomed. Any approach that does not prepare for failure as well as for success is inadequate. Okay, so taking those parameters as given now, for the sake of argument at least, what does this imply in terms of the absolutely crucial area, central obviously to our very existence, of diet and food? As an aside, let me just remark that it is a powerful indictment of contemporary economics, that economists in societies like the US and the UK say things like, well, agriculture is only one, two, three percent of GDP. It's not that important. In the words of uh, someone wise from long ago, one day these people will learn, you cannot eat money. Obviously, we need to eat lower on the food chain. But I want to note the following couple of points. Firstly, this is not a silver bullet. And secondly, it's not even necessarily the main way in which we want to look at the problem of diet and food in relation to climate and ecology. Remember, this civilization is finished. It has a sell-by date. It certainly has a best before date. The paradigm is dead. What this really means is the coming end of industrial growth society. Most people are still assuming there will be more industrialization in the future, more technology. And indeed, of course, some technologies are going to be part of what we need in years to come, very notably renewable energy technology. 
But if the current paradigm is dead, as I've argued, actually there's gonna be less industry on balance in future. There's gonna be less technology. There's gonna be less dependence on technology. If this is not so, we will just push ourselves further off the cliff that we are already hanging off the edge of. So according to this analysis, the key problem we face is not animal agriculture. It is industrial agriculture. That is what cannot be sustained. That is what depends on fossil inputs, which will no longer be available in the future. That is what is contributing to the destruction of our way of life. Now, there is a large overlap between animal agriculture and, in and industrial agriculture, but it is not a complete overlap. Obviously, factory farms have to go. Obviously, feedlots have to go. But there may be forms of animal agriculture which should survive the end, the necessary and coming end of industrial agriculture. Industrial agriculture is going to come to an end. It will either come to an end through intelligent voluntary action on our part to transform everything, or it will come to an end through collapse. The future will involve less industrial agriculture. The future will be more local. It just depends how we get to that final state. So let me suggest to you a few examples of how elements of animal agriculture may survive the end of industrial agriculture and how this may not be a bad thing. First example, care is needed not to dismiss the lifestyle and potential contribution of pastoralists, people who live essentially dependent upon livestock. Let me give you an instance in my own experience. I was in the Carpathian Alps in Romania a few years ago. This is one of the relatively few parts of Europe which has not been destroyed by industrial agriculture, which by the way, has been um, very badly, i.e. strongly funded by the European Union. The European Union has a heavy responsibility for the ending of traditional, less harmful forms of agriculture across Europe. But in parts of Romania, traditional forms of agriculture still survive, including mob grazing, including that is large herds, for example, which I saw of sheep, which are guarded by shepherds with dogs. Yes, shepherds still exist. And in this part of Romania, the Carpathian Alps, the wildlife that is present there is absolutely extraordinarily rich. The ecosystems are far more intact and biodiverse than virtually anywhere else in Europe. I saw bears, there are wolves there, but not only that, the thing which really struck me was the huge number of insects, flocks, as it were, of butterflies. I don't know what the correct, what the correct collective noun is for large numbers of butterflies. I've never seen such numbers of butterflies in the UK. We just don't have that uh, anymore in most of the UK, virtually all of the UK. But they do have it in, in Romania. And I'm convinced that part of the reason why is that agriculture there is still fairly traditional, uses relatively few industrial inputs, and some of that agriculture is pastoralism. Ditto fisher folk, not the industrial fleets. They have to come to an end, obviously. But care is needed not to simply rule out a priori the reliance that many people have on small scale fishing. Another example, it's very crude to assimilate backyard chickens, which may have a role to play in small scale agriculture, in the using up of waste around the house and around the small holding or, or farm, et cetera. Very crude to lump those in with battery hens. Factory farming of chickens, et cetera, obviously has to end, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all agriculture involving poultry has to end. And final example, obviously lots of rewilding is needed and lots is possible if many of us go vegan or freegan or at the very least vegetarian or flexitarian but should this newly rewilded land be left pure wild remember that there's little for humans to gather and forage in many not all in many wild environments 
but in most there is flesh available. I want to put to you a radical notion which some of you may be uncomfortable with. It's paradoxical, but it seems to me it actually makes sense. Imagine a future in which most of us are exclusively vegan or mainly vegan, combined with eating some wild meat. Notice that this will be a better guarantor against hunger than veganism alone, which leaves out, veganism leaves out this potential source of protein. Put it another way, veganism alone leaves us a little more vulnerable to potential hunger in the future, unless of course you're willing to dip in to the stores of wild protein in extremis. The years ahead may well be years of climate driven food shortage. That actually is my fear that the most likely way that our society and societies like it collapse is through food shortages driven by ecological deterioration, driven partly, not exclusively probably, by climate decline. In this context, in this scary context, our food system should be more secure, more sovereign, more local. It should be more diverse. It should have redundancy built in, a good margin of excess calories, etc. Industrial veganism with processed food, etc., at its heart, no, that is not going to be the future. A system that is mainly vegan, based on fresh food, from small family farms, small holdings, community supported agriculture, etc., with probably an added margin of pastoralism or hunting in rewilded lands, that may be our best bet. As I have argued, everything is going to be transformed within our lifetimes. It will either be transformed voluntarily or by force of enraged nature. The ecological crisis in its vast complexity is the issue. It is the issue on which we will be judged by future generations. And if we don't get it right, we will be judged. Industrialism, our current system, with its profligacy, its uber complexity, its long supply lines, its dangerously long supply lines. Industrialism is the problem. Aiming at economic growth is the problem. Industrial agriculture is by definition animal unfriendly. It replaces natural habitats with artificial habitats. It is an endless holocaust against rodents, against insects, and thus against birds. You want to think the future according to industrial agriculture? Imagine a combine harvester stamping on the face of a mouse forever. And this applies whether the food that has been grown is being eaten by vegans or by meat eaters. It's just that meat eating does it at a far worse scale and with far worse intensity. But any industrial agriculture is a systematic crime against animals. It is not, it cannot be animal friendly. Of course, I use the word forever, it will not be forever. This is gonna to come to an end. The only question is, do we bring it to an end voluntarily and intelligently, or is the end imposed upon us by force? The latter, sadly, is much more likely. We must bring about the former as much as possible. And we must do so, I have suggested, in a way that is relatively open-minded. We need an ecological, broad spectrum, collective response to this mother of all crises that faces us. The response cannot be limited to individual or private lifestyle changes. It needs to be broadly political. It needs to center on system change. It needs to revolutionize our food system. But I would suggest in the kind of deep, wide, complex and pragmatic, realistic way I've outlined. Let's build a future that is based primarily in mass veganism. But let's, let's not rule out elements to such a system that are open to the eating by some of some animal flesh as part of a largely local, small-scaled, diverse ecosystem, as we might put it, of agroecological sanity. That is our best bet, I've argued, for heading off collapse. And our best bet 
for eking an existence out through such collapse, if that is what befalls us, as is tragically, increasingly likely. A transformed future beckons. It's incredibly exciting, as well as pretty terrifying. Let's create it swiftly, undogmatically, wisely. Thank you. I look forward to discussing these matters with you. Okay, well, that's, that's great. Rupert, are you there? I am. All right, well, you know, it's nice, nice to meet a kindred spirit, somebody who understands uh, that we really have to take some big steps. Could you, could you explain to me um, uh, what you think the world can look like? Uh, what, what is the best possible scenario? Because mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll be quite honest with you. Uh, I, I really got concerned about the environment 16 years ago when Heather's first uh, child was born, my first grandson. My whole focus changed from uh, an interest in medicine to an interest in, you know, what can I do? Even if it's just a tiny part, what can I do to help people? And I realized that we knew a, a good diet and, and I had to become optimistic and it didn't happen for a long time, but I, I guess maybe I put some blinders on to try and realize our current situation. And I've, I wanted to see an optimistic point of view. Uh, is there one that you have? Yeah, so um, I gave you my uh, my three scenarios in the in the talk. Um, uh, the first of termination, or as I sometimes call it, with a, a little bit of a, a wry smile, though it's not really a laughing matter, the dodo scenario. Um, second, the uh, the phoenix scenario, and third, the butterfly scenario. And as I say, obviously, what we need to do is uh, is aim for the butterfly scenario. Uh, the point I made is that I unfortunately I don't think we can count on achieving that scenario anymore so we have to be ready for the the phoenix scenario we have what we should aim for butterfly what does butterfly mean what would it look like that's really what your question is john like so what i think it would look like is well not a lot like what we have um we would have a world which is far more um local it'd be radically relocalized that relocalization by the way may have been started by covid19 uh covid we may have already seen peak globalization we may never have as much air travel again uh, as we had uh, in 2019. Uh, and that's uh, obviously to be hoped for because that's the kind of change that we need um, if we're going to uh, survive, uh, let alone prosper uh, as a species. So the future will be far more local. Food, uh, food miles in particular will be way, way down. Um, and what we need to be thinking of is, uh, is a, a, lo a relocalized future that is a, a small farm uh, future primarily. We need to reduce scale at uh, virtually all levels of our economy and society. If we're gonna have a, um, a resilient, uh, less monocultural um, society and that's the kind of society that could survive. That's the kind of society that could uh, not uh, collapse. Um, I envisage uh, our future if we manage to achieve this butterfly scenario as one in which we have energy descended a great deal, i.e. we use a lot less energy than we do at present. And of course the energy that we do use would come primarily from genuinely renewable uh, sources, uh, especially the sun, but also other renewable uh, uh, sources. Um, and well, you know, uh, it really could be a, a wonderful world. Um, it could be a world uh, in which, for example, um, people um, have much more control and power over their lives. One of the reasons why there's been the rise in uh, unpleasant far-right populism in recent years is people have felt out of control of their lives and they wanted to take back uh, control. Well, a radically relocalized future that is energy descended, that rebuilds community where people are actually in control a lot more of the, the food that they eat, of the communities that they live in, um, that's, a, that's a future which would actually head off that kind of risk of, uh, of hard right populism uh, if it's done right. So that is my hope. That is what I think. That's the kind of thing that I think we ought to, to aim for. Uh, a transformed uh, civilization in which we live in a way which has some of the benefits of um, the technologies that have become available recently to us, such as uh, renewable energy and hopefully we get to keep the internet uh, as well so we can carry on doing things like this once in a while. Um, but with far less uh, travel, uh, far less use of uh, energy, uh, far less uh, on balance uh, industry, 
uh, and a much more uh, resilient, uh, diverse, small scale, uh, relocalized uh, food system. Well, I have uh, two, two questions. Uh, you are uh, involved with the Green Party in the United Kingdom. What do you see in terms of politics? How, how are we going to have a government that, how, and also an economic system? Do you see capitalism as the, the way to go? Is that going to survive or is that going to continue to destroy us? And the third part of this question is population. So government, economics, and population. Do you have any predictions on that or any thoughts? So there's three questions. Have you got about three hours? That's how long it will take me to answer them properly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll have a little go. Yeah. Um, look, the, the situation on the on the government front is uh, is pretty grim. Um, obviously, it's a it's great news that uh, that Trump lost and that uh, the the Democrats uh, have control in the Senate and so forth so forth in America. But it's all relative, right? I mean, Biden uh, is no uh, Bernie Sanders. Uh, let alone um, a, a Gandhi or something like that, right? Um, what we're going to get in the States in the next few years um, is going to be better than the horrendous rubbish that we got in the last few years, um, but it's not going to be enough. Um, and you, you all in the States, you need to um, get uh, organized now to put maximum pressure uh, on the Democrats to, to, to really deliver as much as they possibly can. Um, you can do that through the Sunrise Movement and Extinction Rebellion and so forth, as I'm sure you know, uh, and in other ways, of course. Um, you need to do that. You know, if, you th if you're thinking, well, Biden and the Democrats are going to take care of it, I mean, they're absolutely not. Um, they only look good compared to Trump, who is, you know, just one step away from Hitler. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a long road we've got to go on the front of government. And frankly, uh, am I optimistic? Not really, if, if the question is, will we do enough and will we do it in time? Um, this is partly why we have to be preparing ourselves for the possibility of, um, of collapse. And of course, the beauty of the transformed civilization that I sort of sketched a minute ago in answer to your first question is that that's also the kind of society that we need that will maximally ensure us against um, the bad effects of a, a societal collapse, right? If people are growing most of their own food uh, locally, um, if people have uh, control over most of the things that they need in their lives within their local community and are organized in their community to exercise that control, then if central government starts to fall apart and long, long supply lines break down, we'll be able to survive that. Um, and that kind of takes us to the second question, right? The question of economy. So you ask specifically, will capitalism survive? Um, I don't know. Uh, and th there's lots that I don't know and lots that, that nobody knows. Um, what I do know, though, is this. If capitalism does survive the next generation, it will have to be transformed. It's the same point again, right? Um, either capitalism is going to do some kind of amazing butterfly jujitsu trick on itself, um, uh, or there's going to be a collapse. Um, so again, do I think it's likely that we're going to get that kind of transformation of capitalism? I don't think it's particularly likely. I think the, I think the vested interests that we face are enormous, absolutely enormous. You know, are the oil companies going to give up without a, a fight to just give one obvious uh, example? And I mean, you know, literally, potentially a fight uh, if it comes to it. Um, so um, we need to be ready to um, we need to ready ourselves for potential collapse. We need to try to reclaim uh, more power um, ourselves and start rebuild, start building, if you will, the alternative economy and society right now within the, the shell of what uh, exists. Uh, at the moment, uh, and, and we need to get on with it. And finally, on the question of population, uh, well, it, it's obvious that um, that the more uh, the human population um, uh, increases, uh, the more we uh, we put ourselves at, at uh, mutual risk. The more we fragilize um, our systems. Uh, this is not um, intelligent. Um, so, what does that imply? Well, uh, one thing that it implies is that. Um, if we're serious uh, about um, all of these problems, we need to find uh, wise, um, um, just ways of seeking to reduce our population. Um, so how do we do that? Well, the, the, the standard remedies are things like uh, making sure that uh, women are independent and are uh, educated, uh, making sure um, that there isn't um, social pressure um, to have more children, 
um, we could uh, use for some uh, intelligent declarations from the Pope here, uh, and also from uh, leaders of other religions such as uh, Islam, um, and and things like that. Um, you know, I don't think anyone wants to go down the kind of route that China went down. Um, but to those who say, "Oh, you can't talk about population reduction because that's that's genocidal or that's nasty or that that's racist or something," you know, that, that's just silly talk. Um, this is these are simply facts. I mean, if you care about having um, much of the world uh, uh, rewilded, if you care about the, the fact that we we desperately need, whether we're going to eat any of them or not, we desperately need there to be rich ecosystems with huge numbers of animals that are not just animals that we've grown uh, uh, to eat um, in our world. If you care about the fact that in my lifetime, more than half the world's wildlife has been wiped out, I mean, absolutely terrifying and appalling uh, statistic, then you have to care about controlling human population. Because if the human population keeps going up and up, well, where are the wild animals going to be? It's, it just doesn't add up. So no one who is serious about um, about uh, wild nature and about wild animals uh, can be in favor of an endlessly growing human population. And I just want to mention the obvious uh, with the, the change in the temperature of the planet, you know, we've just seen the beginning of pandemics. And oh, yes. Viruses are going to are going to cross this earth and do a lot towards population. I, I know a lot of you would like this to be a, a sugar coated, apolitical type of discussion. But unfortunately, politics uh, come into play and you know, they have to come up. Uh, I, we can't say everybody's a good guy because they're not. Well, listen, uh, join us in about, uh, in about an hour and maybe an hour and a half and we'll get together and we'll open it up for questions and answers from the audience. And I'm sure they have a lot of questions. Definitely you had some things to say that were clear. Nobody wonders what, you, what your opinion is. You didn't hold anything back and I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank so, you, Joe. Thank Thanks you very much. Good. Well, we're going to uh, we're going to move along. We're going to have a great morning plan for you. Uh, you know, when I thought about bringing in a religious point of view, uh, I knew I, I knew I would offend some people because that that's of course a hot topic. And I thought about bringing in a a reverend. And was is there a reverend out there interested in climate change? And you know, somebody who would appeal to most everybody and. When I found uh, this uh, particular person, we ran across each other through a lot of speaking engagements together, so I've gotten to know her. Uh, you know, when Heather first watched your presentation, she said, Dad, this is amazing. This is really good. I know you're going to enjoy Reverend uh, Beth Love and uh, her presentation and also our discussion that we're going to have afterwards, too, because I'm going to ask some, some really tough religious questions along the way. You know, what do we plan? How does your religion fit into this? And, you know, are you looking for the end of time? So I'm not. Heather, would you move along with uh, Beth Lowe's presentation? Absolutely. Here we go. We know what is happening, and we know what needs to be done. These words are included in a letter to the future. It is inscribed on a plaque commemorating the first Icelandic glacier to be lost to the climate crisis. After it says, we know what is happening and we know what needs to be done, it says, only you know if we did it. We know what is happening. Human activity has so warmed the earth that we are already experiencing devastating losses, losses of life, of health, of homes, communities, and livelihoods. If we stay on this trajectory, we will reach the point of no return, which will lead to more loss, including the very real potential that our Earth, as we know it, will no longer be habitable for humans and many other life forms. We know what needs to be done. We need to drastically reduce or eliminate greenhouse gas emissions from all sources or risk losing the habitability of our Earth home. Scientists first brought this fact to light decades ago, and the people of the world by and large understand that this is true. A 2018 survey by the Pew Research Center found that the majority of people all around the world in most countries find that the climate crisis is a serious threat. And although more people are now becoming aware that emissions from food production, 
do make a contribution to overall emissions, few realize the full extent of that contribution. What is not in dispute is that animal agriculture of all of the food production sectors is the largest contributor to food related emissions. Part of this is because cattle and sheep and other ruminant animals um, emit a very potent greenhouse gas called methane. The book Drawdown says that if cattle were their own nation, then that nation of cattle would be the third highest producer of global greenhouse gases, third highest nation, the cattle of the world. You can see from this slide that methane, like two other greenhouse gases that are highly associated with animal agriculture, nitrous oxide and black carbon, that they're much more potent in their warming potential than is a, an equivalent quantity of carbon dioxide. For instance, for methane, it's 86 times more warming, nitrous oxide almost 300 times, and black carbon is thousands of times more warming than carbon dioxide. But you can see the good news on the right. If we start reducing animal agriculture and draw these emissions down, stop emitting them, they will be gone within about 100 years, whereas carbon dioxide lasts in the environment for hundreds or thousands of years. Some of it is even left after 10,000 years. So the emissions we're putting out today, the carbon emissions we're putting out today will still be here in 10,000 years. The full magnitude of animal agriculture's contribution has been confused and obscured by industry interests, but public, published studies from reputable sources have shown that the contribution could be as high as 51%, and there is good evidence that exists that indicates that the figure is most, much higher. Regardless of the specific percentage contribution of animal agriculture to overall emissions, the really critical piece for people to understand is that there is no solution to the climate crisis that does not include a massive shift in human dietary patterns, especially in high meat consuming nations such as the United States. In fact, numerous recent studies have concluded that even if we are to completely eliminate carbon dioxide emissions from fuels, transportation, and energy, we will not keep temperatures within acceptable levels unless we accompany those reductions by a significant shift in human diets toward more plants and less animal products. And of course, entirely plant-based diets contribute the least to the climate crisis. We know what is happening. And so far, I've only addressed the climate crisis. That's one of nine planetary boundaries, nine key earth system processes, which if we cross those boundaries, it could result in dangerous levels of environmental change. And animal agriculture is, the, is a leading contributor to at least seven of the nine planetary boundaries, okay? At least seven of the nine, animal ag, a major contributor. We're gonna look at the other six. Other than, other than the climate crisis, here's the other six of those seven. Biosphere integrity. That has to do with the effect that we humans have on the functioning of our ecosystems, as well as on the gene genetic diversity of ecosystems. And animal agriculture is the number one contributor to both biomass loss and biodiversity loss. For instance, through habitat destruction, through pollution, through encroachment on formerly wild lands, through overfishing, through killing predators, predator eradication, we call it, right? Through deforestation and through other means, that is how animal agriculture impacts the biological world. Um, land system change is the next one we'll look at. That includes deforestation. Perhaps the largest way, probably the largest way that humans change the land is through cutting down or burning down rainforests. Forests. And 80% of deforestation is for animal agriculture, 80%. We know what is happening and we know what needs to be done, don't we? We need to stop burning down and clear cutting our forests and we need to replant. We know this, we know this. The truth is leaking out. In 2019, the fires in the Amazon created greater awareness of the fact that the so-called lungs of the planet were being raised to burn. They were being burned to raise cattle for human consumption. 
And the story, as reported, did partially obscure the facts because the reports typically said the rainforest was being burned to raise cattle and to grow soybeans, which could have left people to possibly conclude that vegans such as me are the cause of some of the rainforest burning because of our appetite for tofu and other soy products. But of course, we know that the vast majority of the soy being grown in South America is being fed to pigs that live in Asia, pigs that are destined to be eaten by humans. The fourth planetary boundary will look at freshwater use. Now you probably have heard about water conservation. People know what the authorities tell us to do, right? They tell us to turn off the water when we're brushing our teeth or take a shorter shower, flush less often, you know, uh, find water conserving ways to grow your garden. And this is what we know, but you know what? We also know that you know, our industrial uses, the, there's water that's, that it, it takes to, to produce the, the goods that we buy and consume. But guess what the truth is? It's really the food. It's really the food. Look at this chart. In um, your household uses for the average person is a tiny percent of your water footprint. The industrial goods production is five or six times what, what it takes to water your garden and brush your teeth and all the rest of that stuff. And the food that we eat is over 70% of any individual's average water footprint, okay? So that's what we should be talking about, not the toilet flushing. Um, but once again, it's not all food. Animal agriculture is the leading driver in our race to exceed planetary boundaries. Here you see in this chart, which is depicted in gallons of water per pound of food, that the cattle, the chickens, the, 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 the pork, the, the, the cheese that are raised for, for food, are taking hundreds, if not over a thousand gallons of water to raise one pound of food. Whereas the fruits, the veggies, the, the grains, the nuts are riding much, much lower on the waves. Biogeochemical flows, that's a fancy word to talk about how the two elements, nitrogen and phosphorus, interact with both the physical world and the biological world and how they flow through those worlds. And what we know is that the vast majority of nitrogen and phosphorus in the environment, the, um, the phosphorus and nitrogen, nitrogen pollution in the environment is coming from animal feed, growing animal feed. So they have these great giant big monocrop fields that are, that are so over, overused that they're dead and the farmers pump in tons of chemicals to get them to pump out some food for animals, um, oats, wheat, corn, soy, and most of that nitrogen and phosphorus is not taken up by the plants. Very little is taken up by the plants. The rest makes its way into the soil, into our waterways in the form of pollution, flows out to the ocean and creates these vast swaths, ocean dead zones, hundreds of them in the oceans of the world where nothing can grow because all of that fertilizer has just given a huge boost to algae. There are these giant algal, bloom, algal blooms that take up all the oxygen and nothing else can grow. Ocean acidification, another problem happening in the oceans from CO2 emissions falling on the oceans, causing the water to be too, too acidic. And the ag sector is not the only, but it is a major source of CO2 emissions, for instance, through deforestation, manufacturing use of nitrogen fertilizer, energy use, et cetera. And ocean acidification is taking place at the fastest rate recorded in millions of years. And what happens? The acidic environment interferes with shell and skeletal formation for marine organisms such as coral, oysters, some plankton. And it's, it's not just about losing some pretty corals or some tiny sea creatures suffering, but there are disturbances throughout the food web. For instance, this tiny little sea snail called a pteropod or a sea butterfly is a very important contributor to many food webs. For instance, it's eaten by these giant baleen whales. Atmospheric aerosol loading, that's dust, smoke, haze, other solid and liquid particles that are suspended in the air that we breathe. Animal agriculture contributes through black carbon, again, burning of the rainforest, crop residue, the burning of crop residue, dust that comes up from cultivated land and desertification from overworking the land. We know what is happening. We are not dumb. We know what is happening and it's frightening. Personally, I'm most concerned for our young people. The children of the world are my children. They may not have a planet to call home. There are two more planetary boundaries for which animal ag is a probable contributor, but this is enough for now. 
We know what is happening. And we know what needs to be done. And quickly, we have already left the safe zone and crossed into high or increasing risk zones on five of those nine planetary boundaries, of which four, animal agriculture is the major driver, and it's also a major driver in the fifth. We know what needs to be done. Just as 2019 provided a wake-up call to many people about the, re the reasons for re for deforestation, um, 2020 provided opportunity for the truth about human sourcing of animal foods. People, people were awakened, perhaps rudely, to the fact that our human appetite for meat and other animal products has created perfect context for the development of virulent zoonotic diseases. Diseases that have the capacity to completely put a halt to life as we know it, right? Is that what happened? And although COVID-19 apparently originated in a wet market, we know it's not just wet markets. Intensive animal agriculture also provides the ideal incubator for the emergence of ever more lethal viruses. Pandemics have come from hog farms and chicken farms in the past and could again, and next time we could not, we might not be so lucky. It could be much more deadly. The sickness of the industry was further exposed when slaughterhouses became hotbeds of coronavirus outbreaks. Workers in those death factories, who of course are mostly immigrants and people of color, were thrust into the national spotlight in the U.S. and the public got a tiny little peek into the underbelly of the beast. We know what is happening and we know what needs to be done. Why don't we do it? If researchers ask people why they choose the food they choose, invariably the majority say taste. But these other reasons are also very high for people convenience, people think about their health, what do their family and their cultures eat? And the invisible assumption behind both the question, why do you choose what you choose, and the answers is that people make choices based on conscious preference, will, and personal agency, right? Yet the food choices that most people make are destroying human health, undermining our core values of compassion and justice and leaving millions starving, millions more overweight and inexorably moving us closer to the brink of extinction, robbing the future from our children. I don't believe that people want to be unhealthy or that they lack compassion. I don't believe that people want to destroy the earth or contribute to world hunger or emerging zoonoses. I know there are people that are indifferent to cruelty, but I don't know a single person who would hurt another living being for their pleasure. So what is going on? If most people are decent, and most people are choosing food that undermines human health, devastates the earth, tortures and murders sentient beings, leads to world hunger and pandemics, what is going on? The evidence is clear that this is happening because personal choice has been corrupted by corporate influence. We know this, don't we? Our desires have been warped by marketing, for example. Our taste buds have been corrupted through chemical manipulation of the food supply. The reward centers in our brains have been hijacked. Our family and friend circles have been converted into guardians of the dominant paradigm. Is this right? You try to step out of that and what happens, right? And the formerly plant-centric whole food diets of indigenous in mo people in most parts of the world have been colonized. Who or what is responsible for this overlay of drivers on top of our so-called personal choice? Follow the money. An unholy trifecta of industry groups, corporations, and elected officials is actually profiting off of all this destruction. We know that this is happening as well, don't we? We know that corporate influences are are largely driving our food choices. And we know what is happening and we know what needs to be done, but why don't we do it anyway? I'll tell you why. Because as human beings, when we know what is happening and we know what needs to be done and we aren't doing it, we experience cognitive dissonance. We experience discomfort because our values are not aligned with our practices. Many people deal with the internal discomfort through denial, minimization, numbing, 
and or addictive behavior. But there is another way, a much more sustainable and healthy way, an option where we can resolve our cognitive dissonance by aligning our actions with our values. This is the values, steady. These are our actions coming into alignment and that is some of the most powerful news here because we can do this thing. It's time to take back our sovereignty over our taste buds and our physiology. We can reclaim our capacity to make real choices untainted by fears of not fitting in or having to sacrifice flavor. And what will be the result of our transformation? With the right conditions, hint, hint, look at the picture, the right conditions, our bodies can heal. I love an, an, an analogy that Dr. Michael Greger makes. He talks about the amazing healing processes that spring forth in our body temples when we are injured. For example, if you whack your shin. And then he goes on to say, well, what would happen if you kept whacking your shin in the same place day after day or three times a day? One, breakfast, lunch, dinner. It would never heal. That's what he says, it would never heal. When we make a choice on the other hand to support the healing processes of our bodies, that process can pretty quickly transform our experience. Within a few weeks of reclaiming our sovereignty and consistently eating whole, healthy plant foods, our taste buds will adjust. Over time, our brain's pleasure centers will no longer be attracted to products of violence and destruction. We will start craving healthy food. We will be able to claim the vibrant health that is our birthright. The further good news is that it's not too late to act to bring human activity back within the boundaries of our earth system. The earth too can heal herself when we stop whacking her millions of times a day. The same dietary choice that will allow the body to heal will also allow the earth to heal. And that will result in a complete transformation of the way humans use the earth and its inhabitants. In fact, shifting diets to or toward plant-based is the most powerful opportunity presented by the climate crisis, our very most existential threat, much larger than COVID-19. And in making this shift, we will not only avoid going past the point of no return on climate, but also realize tremendous additional environmental benefits. As a result of this single dietary shift, we will be able to restore the land lost to animal agriculture, clean up our waterways, see the ocean dead zones come back to life and stop the hemorrhaging on habitat loss, on biodiversity loss, on species loss. We can become conscious stewards, conscientious stewards of our earth and its inhabitants, just as we were ordained to be. We can restore the earth as a garden in which our children and many generations after them can live long, healthy, sustainable, just, and compassionate lives. When we are successful in our goal of shifting human diets to healthy plant-based and plant-strong diets, we will also realize a change in humans. We will see that the human presence on earth is more peaceful, spiritually aligned, just, compassionate, and well-fed. We know what is happening and we know what to do. Let's do this thing. Thank you very much. Wow, what passion. Enjoyed that very much, Reverend Beth, Reverend Love, Reverend Beth Love. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, I don't get a chance to have uh, much, much contact with the, uh, the spiritual side, the religious side of life anymore. I was raised as a, as a Christian, and uh, uh, my wife Mary was raised in a very, very strict family. And of course, I have a you know, a certain amount of, uh, of understanding of uh, how life is supposed to be and some of the things I was taught. And I, I would like to, uh, you know, this really is a spiritual thing. This is a moral thing, uh, saving the planet Earth, uh, saving it for us. So you would think that everybody involved in any religion would step up to the plate and say, you know, how can I offend the temple? The temple in this case being the planet. 
the temple in the other cases being our own bodies. You know, it is to me anti-God, anti-religion. What, what, what about that? How do you find people uh, in the religious community? I know you can't speak for everybody, Reverend Beth. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Dr. McDougall, John. Um, I cannot speak for everyone in the religious community. And I, I want to start right up front by saying there's tremendous diversity, obviously, in the religious community. It's actually communities, as we know, many communities worldwide. Um, what I can speak to most authoritatively is my, um, my own tradition, which is new thought. And I will speak a little bit about that. Um, but in preparation for this, since I knew you wanted to talk about the religious perspective, I did do a little bit of research. And I want to say that I, I do not put myself forward as a scholar on world religions by any means. That has not been my course of study. I was, I was born uh, Jewish, but not raised with any Judaism, with any of the religion, with very, very little of the traditions other than that I knew that you got presents on Hanukkah and Passover. <laughs> Um, so um, that was my religious upbringing. And then my mother, a seeker, took us through a few other paths. In fact, I was a Muslim for two years in my teens, and I was actually um, baptized in the uh, Church of Latter-day Saints. Um, I don't think that lasted very long, though. But um, so, so ultimately, I did find myself, uh, find my way to a, a religion that is uh, um, authentic for me, which is New Thought, which came out of Christianity, actually. The early New Thought pioneers were Christians. They were practical Christians that, um, that really took this teaching that Jesus is a great example and that we can do these things too and so much more. They took that to heart and they, um, they looked for the threads of universal truth that ran through all religions. And um, in that they created a, a, a philosophy or a theology that, that came out of these universal spiritual truths. Now, of course, they were uh, of a place and time. And so the religion they created was influenced by the context in which they created it. But um, most people would be familiar with New Thought because it's thoroughly permeated popular culture. So, you know, the song, I believe I can fly, I believe I can touch the sky, you know, the, these ways that we all know that our belief is important, whatever it is that we put our attention on grows in our experience. Um, if we're putting our attention, if we wake up in the morning and we say, oh, this is going to be an awful day. Well, guess what? We're going to have an awful day. And if we wake up in the morning and say, oh, this is going to be a glorious day, we're going to have a glorious day. So that's new thought in a very tiny nutshell. But what I found when I, when I did a little bit of research about world religions is that for the most part, the scriptures of the world and the, the, the world, world religious teachers talk about our role as stewards of the earth. This is one of those universal principles that we have a role as stewards of the earth. And there may be differences of opinion about the exact relationship between God and humans. And in fact, I think that's one of the places of greater uh, disagreement is that some people see God as more of a puppeteer in the sky who we've got someone in the thread here who says that God is going to, God knows when the time is and God is gonna transform the earth. And that's one part of the spectrum is like God has got all the power. And then another part of the spectrum, which is more where new thought falls, is that we are complete co-creators with the divine, that God set us here in this paradise and said, dress and keep the garden, which is in the, the, the Hebrew scripture, which the Christians also use. That's the King James version. There's other, other versions, but essentially dress and keep means to, to, to serve and to care for and to be stewards of this garden that we have been given. And this is in the the the, Ju, Ju, the Jewish scripture. Again, the Christians use it, and there's similar similar injunctions in uh, in most of the religious traditions. So I, I will paste some links in the chat for people who are interested in learning more about specific religions. Um, but this is a common thread. We are here as stewards of the earth, and I take that responsibility very very strongly. I believe that the children of the world are my children. I have for my entire life worked for a better world for the children and suddenly awakened five years ago to the fact that all the good work I was doing in the world with children, with families, with men in, in the state prison system who um, I was helping them heal, heal their childhood wounds, like all that good work would amount to nothing if we lose the habitability of the planet. If we go into either of the two scenarios that Rupert outlined where either it's all gone or we have this phoenix uh, situation. We must work toward that transformation. As hard as it is, we must work to it. That is our charge. That is why God put us here, in my opinion, and the religions of the world agree. Now, I want to acknowledge that there are um, a number of people in different traditions um, 
the the largest percentage of such people, I'll, I'll talk about what it is first. Sorry, sometimes I get ahead of myself. Um, there's a number of people in religious traditions that do believe that there's an end times coming and that these signs, the climate crisis, the complete breakdown, the, the crossing the planetary boundaries in terms of, you know, those other earth systems processes, which when they get out of kilter, it could re result in chaos. It will result in chaos if we don't turn it around. It's already resulting in chaos. I mean, you only have to look around to see, you know, that we've got and where I live in California, I was one mile from the evacuation zone and all those fires that happened. And I know um, Dr. McDougall and Heather, you lost your homes to one of the fires and people, island nations are underwater, as I said. I mean, we know that this is happening and um, and I look around at this and, I, and to me, it's a call to greater stewardship, but to some people, it's a clear sign that the end times is coming, the apocalypse is coming, that it's soon. And they're looking forward to that apocalypse. And I, I wrote something in the chat about, sometimes I talked to, some, to one of these people, I, I met a couple and they were the sweetest, nicest people. And they too are concerned about the climate, but they have this strong faith that God is gonna come in and is gonna lift up humanity and is gonna save whatever needs to be saved and they have such a deep faith in that and you know in a, in a way I kind of envy that kind of faith because my tradition doesn't give me that kind of faith my tradition gives me responsibility and my tradition says we are in a co-creative process with the divine and it is on us to figure out a way to transform these systems so that we can keep um, enjoying this paradise that we've been given to steward but I want to just say that of those people that believe the apocalypse, the end times is coming, that, you know, not surprisingly, evangelical white uh, Christians, Christians are more um, likely to believe that um, and less likely to believe in uh, the, the, the climate change is human caused. And then interestingly enough, um, black fundamentalist sects are or black evangelical sects are also more likely to believe that that God, um, that th these are signs of the apocalypse and that God's in charge, um, but they are more likely to um, acknowledge the impact of climate change and that it's human caused. And I have, a, I have a theory about that. I believe that people, I believe that people who have experienced such marginalization, such objectification, such exploitation for so many centuries, um, centuries of trauma caused by the system that they're already, we know that they're already people who, such people, Black, Indigenous, people of color, um, people who are marginalized already, they're already um, at a greater effect from the climate crisis than those of us who are more privileged. And so uh, my theory is that they, they believe it because they see it and they live it. So that was a long answer, but there you go. That was a complete answer. Thank you. Uh, you touched on pretty much everything that I wondered about, and I want to thank you very much. And we're going to be talking about the Marshall Islands later on this afternoon. We're going to be talking about marginalized people. Uh, certainly, the presentations I brought you so far and I'm going to bring you next are different than I brought you in the first climate change uh, day, the first mastermind presentation. You'll want to watch that. It's up available on YouTube. You can easily find it by putting in McDougall and climate change. There we had a lot of experts talking about, uh, you know, what's going on in the environment, all the destruction and so on. We'll get to a couple of speakers this afternoon that go back to that uh, that uh, serious the serious situation we're in. But I wanted to bring you a, a little different point of view. And so I reached out to people like Rupert and uh, Reverend Beth and, and our next speaker to give you a whole nother point of view, a whole nother tool to understand what's going on and to share with others. And the next presentation I'm going to bring you, who, who, who is uh, a presenter who's a, a PhD in psychology is uh, someone who's touched me for almost 15 years. When I heard her first uh, lecture on this subject at one of our advanced study weekends, and it's not haunted me, it's been a very positive way that I've thought about what she had to say. And boy, oh boy, you, you need to share this with everybody, our next speaker's message, and particularly the children. You know, I asked Heather if she would just take the trouble to have uh, her three boys sit down and watch what Dr. Melanie Joy has to say about eating animals. Heather, you have any comments or you just want to go into the presentation? Well, I just like you, I remember her presentation from, you know, a decade ago and, and it's, it's really stayed with me and 
And my boys are already looking forward to watching this day because it's on their minds too. You know, you're going to be gone in, you know, let's say 20, 30 years. Oh, thank you very much. (laughs) I'm not going to be around for, you know, but they're going to be around for a long time. And so this is so important to them. Um, So uh, without further ado, we will put on uh, Dr. Melanie Joy's presentation. Here we go. I am so grateful that Dr. John McDougall is putting on this conference and I'm honored to be a part of it. And thank you for choosing to join this vitally important conversation as well. If you're attending this conference, chances are you're already aware of the fact that scientists say we have 12 years to make the necessary progress to reverse climate change before it becomes irreversible. And you're aware of the fact that animal agriculture is a leading driver of this problem. And chances are, as well, that you're also aware that eating animals is a leading cause of pandemics, of human health problems, and, of course, of animal suffering. Chances are, too, that you care, perhaps very much, about these issues, and you feel compelled to raise awareness in others to get them to move toward a a vegan or plant-based diet. And if this is the case, then there's a good possibility that you're also aware of the fact that people, even those who are compassionate and rational, don't respond like this when you try to raise awareness of the problem in them. In fact, they probably react more like this. People can be highly defensive against any information that challenges what they see as their right to eat animals. And so it's likely that you feel frustrated and perhaps even despairing because of this defensiveness, exhausted from trying so hard to get others to listen to your message and maybe hopeless in the face of such resistance. And you probably also feel confused, wondering why it is that so many people, even those who care about climate change, who care about animals and who care about living a moral life, nevertheless eat animals and are defensive against information encouraging them to shift toward a vegan or a plant-based diet. And so this is what I'll be talking about today. As a psychologist specializing in the psychology of, of eating animals and in relationships and communication, I'll address the questions. Why do people resist veganism? And how can we bypass this resistance? So let's first look at why people resist veganism. Now, there are obviously many reasons for this resistance, but I'm gonna talk about one key reason, which my research suggests drives many of the others. And this is carnism. Carnism is the invisible belief system or ideology that conditions people to eat certain animals. Carnism is essentially the opposite of veganism. We tend to assume that only vegans and vegetarians follow a belief system. But the only reason that many of us learn to eat pigs but not dogs, for example, is because we do have a belief system when it comes to eating animals. What carnism does is it conditions us to disconnect from our authentic thoughts and feelings when it comes to eating those animals who we've learned to think of as edible. Now, carnism is a dominant belief system. What that means is that it is so widespread that its tenets or its its teachings are essentially invisible. They're uh, woven through the very structure of society, shaping law, norms and laws, beliefs, behaviors, et cetera. And they become institutionalized. This means that they're embraced and maintained by all major institutions from the family to the state. So when we study nutrition, for example, we typically actually study carnistic nutrition. But because carnism as a belief system or ideology is invisible, we don't recognize the carnistic bias that's built into the institutions of society. And when we're born into an invisible dominant system such as carnism, we inevitably internalize that system. We internalize the mentality. In other words, we learn to look at the world through the lens of carnism. 
And this mentality shapes the very way we think and feel about eating animals. Now, I'm going to show a short video that my organization Beyond Carnism and I made um, this year that helps explain this concept of internalized carnism. This man is eating a golden retriever burger with cheese made from horse's milk on a bun glazed with canary's eggs. He doesn't feel disturbed, though, because his brain is plugged into a matrix. Like in the movie The Matrix, this matrix keeps itself alive by remaining invisible to him. And it needs to make sure he continues eating these foods. It distorts his perceptions of reality, so he doesn't see a dead dog or secretions from horses or canaries. He just sees food. This is the matrix of carnism. Carnism is the invisible belief system that conditions us to eat certain animals and to never question why we eat some animals but not others. Carnism distorts our perceptions of those species we've learned to classify as edible, so we see them as food and act accordingly. Carnism is why conscientious people end up supporting an industry that unnecessarily kills more animals in one week than the total number of people killed in all wars throughout history, and which is one of the largest contributors to climate change. The Matrix causes this man to be a passive consumer rather than an active citizen. Most people would recognize carnism as the global atrocity it is if they caught on to the fact that they're plugged into the carnistic matrix. They'd be its challengers rather than its supporters. So carnism teaches us to believe in myths, like the three ends of justification, eating certain animals is normal, natural, and necessary, or that farmed animals aren't individuals with personalities. So for example, we learn to believe that a pig is a pig and all pigs are the same. And carnism makes us feel defensive against anyone or anything that helps us catch on to the fact that we're in the carnistic matrix. Ever notice how you feel when you meet a vegan? The good news is that once we catch on to carnism, everything changes. It's not that we see different things, we see the same things differently. That's awareness. And the carnistic matrix is but one of many matrices we're plugged into. And although each matrix distorts our perceptions of a different kind of individual or group, they all affect us in the very same way. So once you understand how one matrix works, you understand how they all work. With awareness, you can choose what role you play in a system. You can become an ally. So just to clarify, um, the reason that carnism distorts our perceptions or people's perceptions is because carnism is a violent system and it runs counter to core human values, values such as compassion and justice. And most people, even those who don't consider themselves animal lovers per se, nevertheless care about animals and wouldn't willingly support an industry that causes animals to suffer, especially when that suffering is completely unnecessary. So carnism prevents people from recognizing the contradictions in their values and behaviors when it comes to eating animals. And the concepts that I'm talking about here in relation to carnism um, apply whether we're advocating veganism to support animal rights or reasons or for climate change reasons, or even if we're advocating plant-based eating simply for health reasons. Carnism is the internalized system that creates a mentality that causes people to be deeply resistant to any challenges to what they feel is their right to eat animals for regardless of what the reason we're advocating moving toward a plant-based diet or a vegan diet is. Now, We've talked briefly about why people resist veganism. And of course, this has been a very abbreviated um, real overview of carnism. If you're interested um, in learning more about carnism, carnism.org has a lot of information. Um, but now it's time to talk about what we can do to bypass this resistance. Now, the first and most important thing for us to remember to do is to focus less on the content than on the process of your communication when you're talking about this issue. Now, all communications have these two parts. 
The content is what we are talking about. The process is how we are talking or how we are communicating. And research shows that the process matters more than the content, even though most of us tend to focus more on the content, on the statistics, on the numbers, on the facts than we do in the process. So for example, just think about a conversation that you had, um, let's say maybe a month ago or six months ago, or even a year ago. It's possible that you have forgotten the content entirely but you probably nevertheless still remember how you felt in that conversation. The process determines how we feel in a conversation. When our process is healthy, we can communicate about just about anything without arguing and getting defensive. And when our process is unhealthy, we can't communicate about just about anything without arguing. Now, when our process is healthy, the goal of our communication is not to win, which means to make the other person lose. So we're not engaged in a debate. It's not to be right, which means to make the other person wrong. Our goal first and foremost is mutual understanding. This doesn't mean that we don't want to be able to share information with people, share content. What this does mean is that we need to commit to this goal of mutual understanding first, or anything we share beyond that will probably not be received the way that we would like it to be, especially if we're communicating about anything that's remotely controversial. So don't expect the facts to sell the ideology. So often when we're talking about issues of social change, whether we're talking about climate change or we're talking about veganism and animal rights, you know, we feel like if we just got the other person to understand the truth with a capital T, if you just knew what was going on in the world, then you would change your behaviors. But more often than not, we share the facts and yet the other person nevertheless doesn't end up changing their behaviors. People don't change until they're ready to change. We, people are attached to eating animals and continue eating animals for any number of reasons. And we cannot force people to change. I mean, obviously legislation can force people to change, but that's not what we're talking about here today. We're talking about advocacy. And, and the, the principles I'm talking about here apply whether you're standing on a stage, talking to hundreds of people, advocating to people working in, in institutions to work toward institutional change or advocating one-on-one. -on -one we cannot force people to change. And when we try to force people to change, we tend to end up with even more resistance. What we can do, however, is communicate in a way that increases the chances that people will hear our message as we intend it to be heard. So that when they're ready to change, if and when they're ready to change, they will act on the information that we share with them. So share facts, but don't expect the facts to be enough and don't get frustrated when people don't change just because they know the truth about what's happening. It can be helpful when you are sharing information to do so through your own story. Nobody can make your story wrong. Your story is your story. So for example, you know, you can say, um, if somebody asks you, oh, why do you eat a plant-based diet or why are you vegan? You can say, well, you know, I, this is a picture of me a long time ago, 1970, when I was four or so, um, you're yeah, four years old. Um, you can say, you know, I, I actually grew up with a dog who I loved like a family member. And I, I also grew up eating meat and eggs and dairy. And, you know, for, for much of my life, I never really thought about the fact that I cared about one type of animal, but I ate another, you know, when I was eating animals, I didn't even connect the dots. I didn't even realize that I was eating animals. I just looked at the meat on my plate and I saw food. Um, it wasn't until years later when I got sick from eating contaminated hamburger that I stopped eating animals. And then I started learning about what happens to the animals and the environment and my body through eating these products. Um, and that really changed the way that I thought about the issue and, and moved me toward veganism. So share your story. Nobody can make your story wrong and then you avoid shooting. 
It's also important to know when not to advocate. Very often when we feel so passionate about an issue, we feel like we carry the burden of changing the world on our shoulders with us everywhere we go. Every opportunity is an opportunity to change somebody's mind, open their heart, change their behaviors, then we're one step closer to a better world. But that can very easily lead us to burnout. Um, and it cannot, often it's not a great use of our time. Don't advocate to people, for example, who have demonstrated that they're highly resistant to your message. Um, it's always a good idea to focus on the low hanging fruits. There are unfortunately over 8 billion people alive on the planet today. Many of them are not ready or willing to hear our message. And many of them are. So if somebody is really resistant to your message, give yourself permission not to advocate to them. Better, it's a much better use of your time to focus on all of the other people who are ready to hear this. And if you feel like advocating is going to exhaust you, if you want to be at that party and just be you and not have to be the vegan or the plant-based eater for a change, give yourself permission not to advocate. It's also important to remember your own carnism. So often when we stop eating animals, for whatever reason, we forget that we ever used to. And it's, it makes it harder for us to connect with the people whose minds and hearts we might want to open. Um, it's unfortunate, or I should say unfair, that those of us who are vegan or plant-based need to carry the burden of working so hard to bridge the communication gap. Um, however, we are the ones who are going to be more willing to make that effort and in a better position to do so. We are bilingual. We know what it feels like to have lived in a carnistic mindset. And we know what it feels like to have stepped out of a carnistic mindset. Remember your own carnism and share your own carnism. So when people talk to me about being vegan, I say, you know, they might say, are you vegan? I say, well, I am today, but for much of my life, I wasn't. I really want to let them know, I understand. I remember what it was like to feel different than I do today. I can relate to you. I connect. I can connect with you. I might even share that, you know, my favorite carnistic foods that I used to eat. Remembering your own carnism helps to create connection between you and the person you're communicating with. And it also helps you to feel less judgmental. It helps you to step out of this mindset that can be so easy to get into, um, you know, to, to judge the person because of their behaviors when it comes to eating animals. When we're judgmental, this means we've placed ourselves in a position of moral superiority, which is not only unfair and unkind, but also it causes others to disconnect with us and feel even more defensive against our message. I also recommend asking people not to just go vegan um, or to become plant-based, but to be what I call vegan allies. A vegan ally is a supporter of veganism and vegans, even though they're not fully vegan yet themselves. We often assume that either you're vegan and you're part of the solution or you're not vegan and you're part of um, the problem. But this mentality, even though it's understandable, prevents like 99% of the population from supporting to a cause or supporting a cause that really needs all the help it can get. So when we invite people in to be vegan allies, we invite them to use their influence to help in the transformation of carnism and we widen our circle of proponents. I also recommend asking people to simply be as vegan as possible, which reduces defensiveness significantly. People can't actually be more vegan than what's possible for them anyway. So this ask is much more respectful of people's um, own experience and what they feel is possible for themselves. And it really reduces defensiveness because it doesn't set people up to feel like it's an all or nothing choice. And frankly, if everyone in the world were as vegan as possible, the world would become vegan pretty soon. And finally, commit to building relational literacy. Relational literacy is the understanding of and ability to practice healthy ways of relating. When we're more relationally literate, our communication is vastly more effective. Communication is the primary way we relate. And we are in a much better position to help create the kind of compassionate, sustainable world we all want. 
Because at the end of the day, the problem we're working to transform is not just carnism, and it's not just climate change or even social injustices. It's the problem of relational dysfunction, a dysfunctional way of relating to other humans, to other animals, to the environment, and even to ourselves. Now, I've written a book on relational literacy and done um, a lot of work in this space. And so if you can find resources if you're interested in building relational literacy at our website at carnism.org. And finally, this time it's really finally, know there is reason to hope. It is so easy to despair when you're aware of all of the problems that are going on in the world. I have had the privileged position of traveling to um, six continents now, over 50 countries, talking about these issues of carnism, veganism, relational literacy. And what I have seen again and again is that the vegan movement and awareness of relational literacy is growing exponentially. It's growing vastly. Um, I have little doubt that veganism will one day replace carnism as the dominant ideology. The question for me is not whether, um, it is simply when. So let me just wrap up by saying a huge thank you for, um, for participating in this important conversation, this important conference. Thank you to John McDougall for, for putting this together and raising awareness the way you are. Thank you to everyone who is here for being a part of the solution, for helping to create a more compassionate, compassionate um, relational and just world for all beings. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> All the way from Berlin, Germany, Melanie Joy. Uh, the original presentation you gave, which was, I don't know, time flies and could have been 10 or 15 years ago at one of our advanced study weekends, was uh, why we love dogs, eat pigs, and wear cows. You know, that uh, that has been up on my website, drmcdougall.com, and been uh, viewed by thousands and thousands of people. But it's also on, on YouTube. And YouTube came to me about a year ago and said that we're going to censor this and not allow children to watch your presentation. And I asked for a review. I said, I, this is not right. And they came back to the review board and said, you're right. This is a message for everybody, particularly children. You know, I, I can also relate to, uh, to the fact that I was, I was one of the biggest meat eaters, animal eaters that walked this earth. I thought this was my birthright. And my parents were raised uh, during the depression and they could only live on turnips and potatoes and didn't have any meat to speak of. And they promised that their kids would never have to live this way and suffer like this. Well, you know, their kids suffered differently. I had a massive stroke when I was 18. I was hundred pounds heavier than I am now. And boy, oh boy, I just spent my life killing animals and devastating the ocean. I'm ashamed of that, but you know, you express that all of us are kind of ashamed of what we did. And now we have to move on and we have a planet to save, to say the least. Heather, how do you, how do you react to this, uh, what Melanie has to say? Well, it touches my heart. And, you know, I mean, you see the animals and, and you realize that, um, you know, we have, we have cats and we have dogs and we love those, yet people eat chickens and pigs and the same animals, they're all animals and they have, um, you know, minds and they feel. And so, you know, like I was saying in the beginning, I don't know if you heard Melanie, but I remember your talk so well. I remember that, that cleaver you had, you brought a cleaver with you, you know, and, and, uh, and my, my sons have watched that talk and it just resonates so well with, I think the younger generations and it's so important to hear your message. And, and I love that, you know, you're making it accessible. You're giving us ways to talk to people, to change people's minds and that just be as vegan as possible. I think that's a lot less intimidating than saying you must be vegan. You have to stop and just be as vegan as possible. It's a good start. And like you said, eventually we'll all be vegan. So thank you so much. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Heather. Thank you for, I mean, just your, your warm words and your compassion is palpable. And this event is, is amazing. So many people attending, so many people ready are ready for this conversation and really asking the question, um, how can we take this movement to the next level? How can we, you know, it, grow our own knowledge and our own skill set and our own toolbox so that we can be more effective advocates for a cause that needs all the help it can get? Well, we've seen things change. You know, I mean, we're of an age. Uh, I'm a little bit older than Rupert, or uh, I don't know about Beth, but a little older than you are by about nine years. And uh, we see things change uh, in a positive direction. Uh, the, the question, as you well said, is uh, not if people will ch eventually change. They will. They'll either change on their own, we'll be in control, and we'll make it our way, or we'll be forced to change. We won't have any choice because there's not going to be the food available. Our, our society will be different. Our governments will be different. We will, we will change. Uh, it'll be nice if we did it on our own terms. And hopefully this, your presentation, this conference and the rest of the speakers will deliver a message that the, the attendees will feel was worthwhile and important and they're willing to share with their friends and family. And hey, we're gonna change the world. <laughs> we have a, a planet to save and it's worth it, so. Well, you know, I, things have changed so much since I was a little girl. I mean, no one was vegan back then, you know, and now everyone knows someone that's plant-based or vegan. So I know it's not changing as quickly as you want, would like, Dad or Melanie yeah. or anyone here, but, but but things are changing. Yeah, but don't yeah, say, your, me, I was going to say, don't say no one was vegan, Heather. You used to have to go to school and change your sandwiches, exchange your sandwiches with fellow, fellow students. <laughs> I, I the way, lunches with me. I was the weird kid. <laughs> yeah, and, and the way Heather rebelled when she was a teenager, she didn't get into drugs or you know dangerous behaviors. She went to McDonald's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the first the first time that Heather really had meat was when we flew from Hawaii, Honolulu to uh, to Disneyland. And uh, you know, I, I happened to know the controller at the Honolulu airport, and he gave us a upgrade to first class and. I had to teach Heather and her brother, Patrick, how to use a knife and fork because they wanted to try a piece of meat. You know, I mean, that's you, you've had a whole different, uh, whole different way of being raised and your kids have too, but it's possible. We could all change. Melanie, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, not at all. I mean, to, but to your point, the world is absolutely changing. And we, of course, still have a long way to go. We all know that that's why we're here. We know the urgency of, of our message and of this movement. Um, and I just, I remember when I went vegan back in 1989, and my mother thought, uh, she thought I was going to die before my 30th birthday. I was 23 at the time. And then my mother, just a few years ago in her 70s, became vegan. And, um, you know, and it's so interesting because, as I said in the presentation in the video, I've, I've been traveling around the world, raising awareness of carnism and met with people in positions of leadership in the vegan movement all over the world and also people who are, um, you know, a lot of reporters for major publications who are interviewing me about carnism, about this issue. And they're all saying exactly the same thing to me. They're saying, wow, in the past five years or some of them say in the past three years, there's just been this explosion in awareness. And it doesn't matter where I am. I was in Kuwait a couple of years ago and we were eating in these Kuwaiti vegan restaurants and getting you know, interviewed by Kuwaiti press in Latvia, Lithuania, Taiwan. Um, I'm seeing the same thing over and over again. So <clears throat> I like to share this information because I know I have a very privileged position to have been having this conversation with people who are really in the know in so many different places. Um, and people who are not traveling like that, it's, it's really easy for us to just get stuck in this mindset of, you know, we, we're so aware of how massive the problem is and how far we have to go that it's really easy not to have hope and not to realize that there really is so much, so much change happening. Well, we have, uh, we have another hour and we're gonna invite our other speakers in. And uh, I would suggest we start out by, <clears throat> we would like to have your questions, comments through the chat board from all of you viewers. And uh, now is the time to start putting them in so that Heather can go through them. But I, I think it'd be appropriate to start out with uh, how the speakers felt about each other because it's so different. 
I mean, I brought together three people that have such a completely different perspective about this, but every one of your messages is so crucial. You can't just beat to death the fact that the planet's in trouble. You know, we have to have uh, a discussion about uh, people's faith. We have to have a discussion about about the basics of uh, why we eat meat. And we have to have a discussion about politics and, and what the future is going to be. And so I, I really feel like I hit it right on the spot. I, I got the greatest speakers I could possibly get to come together to start this presentation out. So uh, comments, Rupert, uh, about e the, either of the other two speakers or Melanie or, or Reverend Beth, you, you have a comment about what the, you, cause you didn't know these people before I brought you together this morning, I would guess. No, I didn't know uh, Reverend Love. Uh, I'm well aware of, of Melanie's work, which I think is super important. Um, I, I enjoyed the two presentations very much and found them uh, very powerful. Um, obviously, there's a difference in nuance between uh, my presentation and, and their two presentations. Um, and the difference in nuance is that I want to be a, a little more um, cautious about just pushing a message of hope. I think that hope is obviously a wonderful thing and a necessary thing, but hope can be dangerous too if it leads us to um, be blind to um, realities uh, that are that are there. So, so that's why I put put forward this this very you know uncomfortable message, frankly, uh, which is uh, yes, uh, we can have a better future um, if we work for it really hard and fast, uh, maybe. Uh, but we also have to be ready for the very um, serious possibility that uh, it's not going to it's not going to work out. Uh, okay. And so we need to be we need to be um, leavening our active hope uh, with uh, with realism the whole time uh, and with uh, preparing for uh, a harder landing. Now, as I said, in answering one of your questions, John, that actually doesn't make that much difference to what we do. Um, but it is a difference in attitude. It doesn't make that much difference what we do because most of the things that we need to be doing to prepare ourselves for the possibility of a harder landing are the same things that we need to be doing um, to uh, aim at uh, the transformation uh, that we all want. But, but one possible difference is that we might have a, a more um, pragmatic uh, attitude um, to uh, whether or not there are circumstances uh, in which we would be willing to uh, eat uh, animals um, if we're thinking of the possibility of, of the negative, uh, more negative outcome as well as of the more positive outcome. Uh, and I'm worried about a situation in which we um, put ourselves in the position of a certain kind of uh, moral purity, um, which I think, you know, Melanie is very good at avoiding that, but it's, it's hard not to, not to feel somehow kind of superior to people who are, who are not vegans. I'm worried that we that if we put ourselves in that position of moral purity, that will just be compromised and it will just break if if times get hard and all the good work of uh, of uh, of um, proselytizing for veganism will then um, come to nothing. So that would be that, that's the kind of thing that I do is make these kind of awkward uh, uh, challenges as philosophers have always done. Uh, and and so that's where I stand. Super impressed with both the presentations, but still feeling a little difference of uh, of nuance between where I am and, and where they are. Well, that's why we brought different speakers together, Rupert. Yeah. You know, you need to hear things from so many different points of view, and each of our viewers has their point of view too. So, uh, any comments, uh, Reverend Beth or Melanie? Yeah, I would like to say um, just just to respond to what Rupert said, and um, yeah, and I apologize. I have not seen the other two talks, so I can speak to your comments. I just joined. Um, you know, when you saw me come in the chat box. Um, I don't believe that hope and pragmatism are mutually exclusive. In fact, I think that they're mutually reinforcing. I can say that from a, from a psychological perspective, it's especially important to focus on hope. Despair is the Achilles heel of advocates and activists from all sorts of social justice movements. And I've been working in this movement, in the vegan movement for a very long time. And I've seen very high rates of burnout, many people quitting the movement, many people becoming misanthropic and disillusioned. It takes a, a tremendous psychological and emotional toll to be vegan in a dominant animal eating culture and to deal with the pushback and the, the repression and the resistance um, and the marginalization and the 
you know, the, the hostility that many vegans experience. And it's very, very easy. The default, in fact, tends to be despair of many people, people who are awake to the climate crisis, people who are awake to what's actually going on in the world. So I, I believe that helping people to see the reasons to be hopeful is a very, very important part of what we need to do if we truly want to be strategic one can be hopeful and one can be realistic at the same time and recognize that indeed more animals are slaughtered in a week than the total number or a day than the total number of people killed in all wars through hit throughout history which i talked about in the video we yep. know this to be true and we can nevertheless work toward um you know a future build our advocacy skills learn how to be and think as strategically as possible with maintaining a sense of hope as a part of that strategic approach to motivate us to continue to carry on. Yeah, I mean, just one quick uh, point on despair. I guess I, I agree with what you said there, but my experience with despair, and I learned this from my teacher, Joanna Macy, is that what's really crucial is to be willing to actually feel your despair and to work with it and to work through it. And I worry that sometimes we, we try to talk ourselves into a kind of hope that sort of bypasses uh, the despair. You know, th there is good reason to, uh, to feel despair, but the key thing is not to get, is to admit that you're in despair and not to get trapped in it. Um, so, you know, th that would be how I would see it sort of um, 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 in terms of psychopolitical terms. Right, well, there's Pollyannish hope, which is based on, not based on fact. And then there's hope, which is your one's ability to stay connected with their sense of inspiration in the face of the facts that they're aware of. And I think, you know, all too often, we tend to default to a sense of hopelessness, which is despair, as opposed to hope within this sense of sadness and grief for the reality of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I just I want to add, Rupert, that I, in terms of your your statement that there might be nuance between us, that I can agree with almost everything you said when you um, when you delineated the difference between our approaches. Um, I I think it's a it's incredibly important, for example, that we acknowledge the pain, the collective trauma that we are experiencing as a global human family and um, how this system that we've co-created together is impacting all of us, but most primarily some of us more. And so I, I couldn't agree more there. The only, the only little nuance I find is that I just wanna acknowledge that, you know, there, there may be a time when there may be a, a context in which meat eating is um, necessary for um, some people, but I just wanna, you know, make a stand that we are always all at choice and even though our contexts do limit the choices that, um, and I'm not, I'm not pushing back against uh, anything you said actually, but just to say that I think that messaging is important. And I love um, Dr. Melanie that you're saying, um, you know, for people to go as vegan as they can. And, you know, for us, um, my organization, Eat for the Earth, we're not even asking people to go vegan unless they want to. We're not using the word vegan. You know, we're asking people to eat um, in a way that is sustainable for the entire population of the world to eat. And so it could be that people want to go all the way to plant-based and we're super happy to rush in with resources to support that. But it could be that somebody just wants to be a reducitarian. I don't, I'm going to take the word just off. It could be that somebody embraces reduce, reducitarianism. There was a, you know, a heavy meat eater and that's a huge contribution too. In fact, if we can get 10 of those heavy meat eaters to reduce, that's going to make a much bigger impact than getting one person to go to plant-based. So so I don't, I don't know that there's that much, not much nuance, nuance between us. I also want to say that like when you were, when you were telling it like it is, when you were going through like the, 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 the position that we're in, like inside, I'm going, amen, amen, amen. Just like I do when, when Greta does it, you know, like she stands there and she tells the truth and she doesn't hold back. Like we need that. We need that as part of our movement. And we also need to find ways to message things that give people more hope for me personally. There has been nothing that has given me more hope than COVID-19, than the way people behaved in response to COVID-19. When I, um, right before it started, I was starting to feel a little bit of the despair that you were talking about, Dr. Melanie. And when I saw that within 
a very short period of time, immediately governments were taking action to make change and people were taking action to make change in order to um, be better citizens, in order to uh, make sure that the, the community was safe and healthy. I was like, wow, this is great. I was grinning for three months at the beginning of, of COVID-19. Like, just like, how can we take this? How can we take this experience and help people to make the connection with our movement? Which of course, for me, as someone who's driven you know, my veganism is not about the environment, but I am driven because I love the children of the world and I want them to have a place to live. Like, how can we help people understand that this crisis, this environmental crisis that you talked about so well, Rupert, that this is um, a bigger threat than, the, than COVID and it is equally imminent. It is right here, right now, and we need to deal with it. One quick point on, on, on Greta, if I may. It is very striking that, uh, that what Greta says uh, is that she do, she's not interested in calls for hope, or she wants his action. Um, and I think that the way that Greta and the school climate strikers and Extinction Rebellion have really cut through in the last few years is by not having this traditional emphasis on, on hope, 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 but on saying, no, let's feel the whole gamut of our emotions, including anger, including despair, and, and all that comes from love at the end, right? L l anger, grief, terror, they all come from, from love uh, at the root, but they take different roots uh, uh, thereafter. Uh, and, and I think that when, when Greta, who's had the more resonance than anybody in the last few years, says, um, let's focus less on hope and more on action, I, I think that's worth listening to. From Berlin, from the United Kingdom, and from California. Isn't that amazing, folks? What a world we live in. With technology the way it is, we can, we can make a difference. Heather, you have uh, some things. Do you have uh, some things you'd like to say? And uh, maybe some of the chat box has some questions for our speakers. Well, I think you know people are wanting some action within the, the government. And people are asking if anyone's written any letters to um, John Kerry, President Biden, or anyone else in the current administration regarding the necessity to address animal agriculture in addition to the, you know, the transportation problem we're having. I can, maybe, I can maybe, answer that yeah. um, a little bit differently than that. But, um, you know, one of the things that Eat for the Earth does, my organization that I started, is that we, um, we focus on our, our, local, uh, our local environment and, um, and are also in community with others around the world who are doing this work. And I, I, really, I really believe, like Dr. Silas Rao does, that uh, or no, I'm, I'm sorry, it's um, Nelson Campbell. Nelson Campbell really believes that we need to take action at the local level, because sometimes at the federal levels, it's, you know, there are countries in the world that have made incredible steps that have taken really great actions, you know, recommending that people cut their animal product consumption by 50%, things like that. But here in my country in the United States, I think we have more power at the local level. We can, we have more access to the elected officials and we have more, we have more um, influence over the elected officials. And I think we have a lot more power there. So for instance, we're in conversation with our, our County Board of Supervisors right now about some actions they can take that can reduce our consumption-based um, food-related greenhouse gas emissions here at home. And we're also in conversation with the local jails about a pilot project to introduce a whole food plant-based diet and education to those inmates that opt in. And, um, and, and then we have a, a, we're partnering with Plant Peer Communities with <coughs> Nelson Campbell they're going to do a study um, of this project so that we can report results in behavioral and health changes. And so in that way, we can, we can influence the movement and give more activists in other areas tools and, and ideas for them to implement. And that gradually we can, we can um, see this sea change that, that we already are, are in, but we can amplify it. Thanks, Beth. Um, so our another question again about the current administration. Um, are you encouraged or discouraged about the new administration? They're talking about clean energy and um, you know eliminating fossil fuels. Or is there hope that they're going to start talking about diet? That's why. That's why we're doing this conference, Heather. Is, is, you know, we have to. We have to. I mean, this is more than fifty percent of the solution. And we have to open a crack and let the light shine in. And hopefully uh, what we're creating here is going to give us a voice 
So we can start talking because nobody else is. Al Gore's not, Greta's not. Nobody's talking about it. Somehow or another, you, people can't see beyond their own dinner plate. And that's the problem. They're being blinded by their own eating habits. Not great. Um, <laughs> a, a quick remark to, to follow that up. Um, yeah, they, they're not talking about diet at all, really, are they? Um, and they're also not talking about the, the destruction of uh, ecosystems. Uh, if I were you all in the States, I would be really focusing on trying to push Biden and the Democrats to be to be much more serious across the whole piece on climate and ecology. Uh, and that means uh, uh, preserving and growing, uh, rewilding, reforesting uh, large parts of America and other parts of the world, really. Um, uh, and uh, and it, it obviously has to mean um, dietary change as well. Uh, they could get quite a long way by doing some of these executive orders, right? They could order um, federal agencies, et cetera, et cetera, to, to change their procurement, to change their, their dietary packages, et cetera. They could, they could make some quick progress with executive orders if they really wanted to, the way they already have in terms of uh, some stuff to do with oil. But unfortunately, the, the lobbying, for, lobbying from the meat industry and the dairy industry is so powerful that, uh, you know, they shut the candidates down. They're not going to get any money, any contributions. This happened with Hillary Clinton and her campaign is that uh, even though her daughter was vegan and her husband, uh, Bill Clinton, followed our program and solved his heart disease uh, problems. Uh, when, when she came out, when Hillary came out and... Uh, uh, she had an opportunity to really make some tough, solid statements about her daughter being a vegan and her husband being saved by a vegan diet. She didn't. And I, I know why, and I, I can't blame her. And, you know, I, I'm sure every politician, we just see that in this country, how, uh, how the electorate, uh, how the people that are voting uh, really determine whether or not these, uh, the candidates are honest, whether they're moral. I mean, they, they have committed such acts of immorality that are beyond my belief. So, you know, the power of getting back into office and keeping your job can't be underestimated. Yeah. Yeah, I could add that um, there, you know, there's, there's action that's happening, um, but it is hindered by carnism. You know, it is hindered by this unholy trifecta of industry groups, corporations, and elected officials who are in their pockets. Um, the Climate Crisis Policy Group has put, put forth 10 bills, and they've got sponsors for these bills um, in the United States Senate and House of Representatives that will address the climate crisis. And even though um, the, the body of work that they, um, that they drew these policy suggestions out of included dozens of suggestions about dietary change from organizations like ours and huge organizations, um, you know, I think... Uh, I think that uh, ProVeg weighed in. I mean, there were huge organizations that weighed in with these dietary suggestions. Out of the 10 bills, four are related to agriculture and not one of them touches diet. They're all about production side changes. And we know that production side changes an alone will not be enough. So yeah, I think that you know, it, you, you're right, that um, it, it's, a, it's a tough nut to crack to figure out a way to get this conversation into the, um, into the political arena. I want to mention, you know, in the chat, there's all uh, sorts of people that are typing in, you know, places you can go to sign petitions and, and, you know, things that we can do at a, at a, a small level, but th that could really make a big difference. So if, if you're not in the chat, go in the chat now and you can see some places to, to add your signature. Uh, let's see, someone did make a comment about um, why can't we get wise plant-based doctors like McDougall, Gregor, Campbell, Barnard, Ornish to get together and create a movement. There's strength in numbers. <laughs> well, the, you, the, the people you mentioned uh, actually have all touched on the subject and, and we have a lot of agreement and uh, we've worked together, but I think it's a great idea. As a matter of fact, I invited uh, many of the people that you mentioned to look in on our conference that we're having today. And, uh, you know, it would be okay if they started their own movements and their own conferences and so on. But quite honestly, is nobody's taken up the, the banner. Uh, Heather and I have decided that what we want to do, and we fortunately have a 501c3 foundation that will support these efforts. And, you know, you might consider looking into that foundation. Uh, it's called the McDougall Research and Education Foundation. 
uh, we've dedicated the money to that, uh, from that foundation to, uh, to this, this cause. And we hope to continue to, uh, to build on this message. And we're bringing in other people. We're bringing in web designers. Uh, we plan on having a website entirely dedicated to diet and climate. Uh, we're going to be optimizing our research engines. We're going to be adding marketing people. You know, we're going to, we're going to really put some money and some effort behind this. And to have uh, my friend Dean Ornish and Neil Bernard and the others, uh, oh boy, we go back a long way, Esselstyn and Campbell and I. So to have them add to the, uh, to the message would be great. As a matter of fact, I can see how just inviting those uh, men, and they all have to be men, that's just too bad, huh? Uh, those men to uh, to contribute to a conference. Maybe we should do this, Heather, and just have, you know, the old timers come in and talk about our work over the past uh, 40, 50 years and how we'd like to dedicate ourselves to this noble cause, saving saving the earth for, for its inhabitants. And there I, is already, in, in many ways, a movement. I mean, there's a there are two sort of uh, parallel movements, the plant-based movement and the so-called vegan movement. And what I've been... What I've been excited about is I've been seeing more and more people. When I, you know, first got into this work, um, there was a much more rigid divide between these two so-called movements or two approaches. You know, people would identify as either ethical vegans, as though taking care of one's body is not ethical, you know, or a plant-based not even a vegan, but somebody who supports plant-based diet. And so there was a much, much um more rigid divide between people who were eating a plant-based diet for, for human health reasons versus for the health of the planet or the health of the animals. And I've seen a lot of crossover um, happening, more and more crossover happening. And, and one of my awakenings actually was when I met you, um, John, at your conference, um, when I gave my talk there, because I remember, I think, 90 some odd percent and almost everybody I spoke to there I was trying to get to know people over the weekend I was one of the last speakers on the last day and I was curious about the audience and there was not a lot of awareness of animal rights for sure interested in, in what you know at that time was called ethical veganism there was a very strong focus as one would expect of course on plant-based eating for one's own health and I remember after giving that talk how open and receptive people in the audience were um, in large part because they had nothing left to defend I mean they weren't part of the problem anymore and they were also seeing this same kind of like defensiveness and resistance in their family and friends even though they weren't animal rights people they were saying well you know I'm concerned about my brother he's had open heart surgery and he's still eating his steak every day but he looks at me like I've got two heads tells me don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal shuts me down and so what I realized is that number one once people stop eating animals, regardless of the reason, and, and research, later research has corroborated this, they become much more receptive to, um, you know, information about carnism and animal rights in general, much more open to this information because they're just not in a state of defensiveness in the same way anymore. Um, and I also realized that people who are eating a plant-based diet are experiencing many of the same kinds of forms of resistance as, you know, so-called ethical vegans. And so I have seen over the years more of a crossover um, between these two, these two groups, which gives me a lot of, sorry to use the bad word here, hope. Um, but it does give me a lot of hope because I, you know, these two sort of parallel movements now are starting to unify and that creates a lot more synergy, um, which is very, it's very interesting to me. And, and it's something I'd like to be doing more writing and speaking around. And I think this conference is actually a great example of that. You hosting this conference is a great example of this kind of crossing over. Well, let me tell you a little bit about my, my history over the last almost half a century. Is uh, my, my whole thought and being was dedicated to taking care of my patients as a medical doctor. And that's all I was uh, concerned about. I was insensitive to the environment. I didn't understand the animal rights issues. Uh, the, there wasn't much talk about the environment back then. And so I felt that uh, the way to, uh, to make myself more acceptable to the general population was to declare up front that I wasn't vegan, even though I was. Uh, I would tell people that I eat turkey every other Thanksgiving. 
Now, I'd never tell him which Thanksgiving I had turkey or whether I really did or not. But I've carried that message for a long time. And hardcore vegans have come up to me in rage. Why do you say that? Well, you know, I, I want to be, I want to bring in the larger number of people. And I've had confrontations with groups about my uh, message that I have turkey every other Thanksgiving. I don't. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I said to them, look, I've saved more turkeys than you saved. So I understand uh, there's, a, there's a, a place for moderation and not offending people by being radical and so religious. And uh, over the years, I have uh, become well aware of the importance of animal, the animal welfare. I mean, it's just, it's very touching to me. It's a big deal. And as I told you, uh, the environment to me is everything. I pretty much given my, uh, my medical practice over to Heather and other medical doctors. And, you know, I still like medicine. I still love taking care of patients. There's nothing more rewarding than to have people be cured. I mean, cured from inflammatory arthritis, uh, multiple sclerosis, diabetes, heart disease. I mean, you know, other doctors feel terrible because they have tools that don't work. They, they end up uh, with patients that are just full of, just taking bags full of drugs and have uh, checkerboard uh, abdomens from all the surgeries they've had. They end up uh, sick people. They get a bunch of excuses and a bunch of treatments from the patients. One unique thing about my practice over the years is is I really help people and by just giving a very simple message, a cost-free message, one that they can do themselves and share with other people. And that is, look, the problems of food. You're eating like an aristocrat. You're eating like kings and queens of old. The pictures of kings and queens of old are obese people with gout in their feet. It's been going on for thousands of years. It's just that uh, since the Industrial Revolution and uh, the harnessing of fossil fuels, uh, well over half the population is able to eat and live like kings and queens. And you can see it. And the way they get well is they go back to the traditional diet of people. You know, the people who used to work in the fields, uh, the people who lived on rice, who lived on potatoes, who lived on uh, wheat and so on. And that very simple message, cost-free, good for every aspect of people's lives, their religion, their finances and everything, is a, is, has made my life very, very uh, enjoyable and rewarding because I've been able to do something that really makes a difference, and that is helping other people. That's, that's where the rewards are, and I'm very grateful that I've had a chance to share that message, and I'm really excited about what we're doing now in terms of uh, spreading something that was uh, just taking care of individuals and could have taken care of our whole healthcare system, spreading it to uh, putting it in this little bit of vital information. It's stated by many scientists these days that even if we solve all the fossil fuel problems, you know, maybe back in 1970, that would have been enough. Even if we do that now, that's not gonna be enough. We have to take it and make a worldwide dietary change to save this place. And I believe that would be true. And that's why all of my efforts for the rest of the days that I have are gonna be dedicated to uh, making this kind of difference. And I realize we're starting out young, we're starting out making a very little difference, but hey, <laughs> God, the things are changing. And I want you to know, I see the political environment quite rewarding, particularly since where we came from. I mean, I was so excited to have uh, Biden spend a whole day talking about the climate. Yes, he doesn't understand that diet is over 50% of the solution. He doesn't understand. But can you imagine if somebody from this conference uh, came to his political team and made them aware of this? Oh, wow. Just takes one person. And therefore, you know, I really thank all of you for making this a very successful day so far, because we have a world to save. Well, I think the amazing thing is that what you've been teaching for so many years, the right diet for our health and our body is also the perfect diet for the planet. And, you know, it's good for animals. So it all just, you know, works together. And it makes sense that this should be our next, our next mission. It's also good for COVID-19. I was Real pleased that all of our speakers mentioned how, what, what good this pandemic has done because it's opened people's eyes. It's uh, shown us that we can change the environment. There's been a 10% reduction in global warming gases. You aren't flying anymore. They'll never fly at the rate that they used to before. Uh, people are working from their home offices. You know, this kind of conference that we're having right now would not have been possible certainly without spending you know, $100,000 or you know, half a million dollars to put this conference on. We're able to do this because of COVID-19. And, uh, and you know, it's not gonna change. But one of the things I wanna add here is that 
whether or not you progress from asymptomatic infection or a mild flu-like infection to hospitalization, the need for mechanical ventilation and or death depends upon what they call comorbid or premorbid conditions. That's just a way of saying people are too fat and sick, but they're, I mean, they're free to say it. Even, even Anthony Fossey, he, he gets on in front, of our con uh, in front of our Congress in June of this year, and he tells them, look, you just don't go on to serious illness unless you have comorbid or premorbid conditions like diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. It would be really nice if they used the proper words. You know, if you're obese, you have type two diabetes, you know, you're dying from food poisoning because you eat like a king and a queen, then COVID's gonna kill you. But nobody speaks in those words. They speak in words that don't cause much reaction. Comorbid, premorbid, who the heck knows what that is? You know, who, who, does that call to action? No. Uh, but anyway, it makes all the difference in the world. We've known that even before the virus came from China, that people who have these comorbid, premorbid, people are overweight, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. Sick people, they don't have an immune system to protect them from this virus. And they go on a diet at rampant rates. Yeah, age is an issue, but you certainly can't do anything about age. But you can fix the other problem. We've been doing that. Heather and I have been doing that for a long time. And our success rates published in the scientific literature are phenomenal, better than you can ever imagine any drug would. Uh, I don't even put that in the same category. The results we get are cures. And the results they get at best are covering up symptoms. And the progression of disease is at the same rate. You just die drugged. You die, you die at the blessings of the pharmaceutical and the hospital business and the doctors. Dr. McDougall, I so appreciate all your great work to bring this message of health to the people for so long and, um, and that, you know, the radical transformations that people are experiencing, you know, the, the transformation that, that Rupert was talking about earlier, like as we, as we experience these individual personal transformations, that does make the more global transformation more possible because we reach critical mass. And I, I just want to honor and acknowledge and thank you for all of the people that you have helped to get on a more sustainable more healthy, more compassionate diet over all these years. And if I, I could, I'd like to answer a question I saw earlier in the chat about radical joy. Would that be okay? Yes. I was just going to yes. bring that up. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, and, and both, both um, I, I was tagged and so was, um, so was Dr. Melanie and I'd love to hear her perspective on it as well. Um, yeah, so to me, um, the, the way to experience radical joy is to allow myself to experience all of my emotions. And so that does mean, in fact, feeling that despair when it comes up. It does mean, you know, feeling that hopelessness when it comes up. And that's a really key part of it is like not to shadow any parts of myself that have some, some um, emotion that's going on. Another really key part for me is to take radical action. And so I can feel like I'm doing my part. So, you know, five years ago, I quit my, my comfortable job where I had, um, where I, I felt so competent and, and confident and where I was well-known and where I was well-respected in my, in my faith-based community. I was a leader in a church that I helped to found and was there for over 20 years. And, you know, I loved my job. I absolutely loved it. But when I came to that realization that I spoke about earlier, that the work that I was doing in the state prison, the work I was doing with the families, with the children, with the adult learners, that none of it would amount to anything if we lose the habitability of the earth. I quit my job and I jumped into this huge unknown and um, have done everything in my power to get the message out that it's not just about transportation, energy and fuels, that we must, must, must change our diets globally if we're gonna make it as a species. And so like for me, that combination, there's one more thing, but that combination of being honest, rigorously honest about the feelings that I have and taking action um, those are really important foundations. And then for me, and I know not everybody in this room may have a spiritual path, um, but even if you don't have a spiritual path, I think it's important for people to find meaning. Some people are humanists. Some people have different religious beliefs. For me, like having some kind of spiritual anchor. And for me, that is that no matter what happens, that there is a place in which we are all going to be okay. And that's my new thought training. Like, like even, if the, even if we have that worst case scenario that Rupert talked about, and, um, and we are forced off the planet through um, you know, chaos and destruction, and we can no longer be here and, and life as we know it ceases, 
that there is a place in consciousness, a place in awareness that I can go where I know that all is well. And you know that that may be um, not very comforting for people who have no religious belief, but I do, or no spiritual belief, but I do think that that trifecta, those three things, like take action, be honest about where what your feelings are, and find a way to make meaning. Find a way that you know there's something that's going to be okay no matter what. So that's it for me. Radical joy. In moments. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. How about you, Melanie? Um, yeah, that was lovely, Beth. Thank you. Um, it was really, I, I, I felt myself taking in what you were saying deeply, um, and I appreciate your words. I mean, I think it's, um, it's very important. I don't know that I can speak to radical joy or any kind of a radical emotion, but maybe just emotionality and, and relating to our emotions in general, you know, so that we can be the healthiest, you know, as healthy as we can be doing this challenging work that we're trying to do. And I think it's, you know, our, what's less important is the emotions we have, more important is how we relate to our emotions. And so a lot of what gets us into trouble and what gets in our way and prevents us from being sustainable, you know, as, as advocates and as human beings. As I said earlier, um, it's, it's very challenging when you're awake to the reality that, you know, we're living in the midst of a global atrocity that is carnism and more broadly that is speciesism. There are many global atrocities we're living in the midst of. And when we are awake to this reality, um, we can very easily become traumatized. Um, many of us are. Many of us feel understandably this burning sense of urgency to help create a better world as quickly as possible. And that's a beautiful thing and that's a gift. And the awareness of the atrocity coupled with the sense of urgency can lead us to relate to our mission, our activism, and ourselves and our own emotions in a way that's counterproductive. So what I think is so important is really working to number one, develop our inner observer or our self observer. Um, you know, this is the part of ourselves, anybody who meditates knows what I'm talking about. It's the part of yourself that's always been there, that always will be there, that is just observing, it's just watching. It's not making a judgment. It's not creating a narrative. It's noticing what's happening inside of us and sometimes around us, but inside of us is most important for what I'm talking about right now. If we don't have this inner observer muscle built up enough, we can continue to get shocked and hij basically hijacked by our emotions and um, driven by compulsions and driven by our trauma, essentially. And we bring that into our work. One of the reasons that I, I was talking about hope earlier and I find it important to do so is because the, there's an imbalance when we are, you know, when we're awake in the midst to, to these, the fact that we're in these atrocities, um, we tend to become not only to some degree traumatized, but we tend to have an imbalance of emotions in us where we can be more consumed by anger. We can be more riddled with anxiety. We can be more gripped with grief then we are able to experience the other emotions that we need to balance these emotions out. And when we develop our inner observer, we start noticing, oh, I'm feeling sadness. Oh, I'm feeling grief. Oh, I'm feeling afraid. Oh, I'm feeling anger. I'm feeling moral outrage right now. And that observer gives us the opportunity to pause and determine how we are going to respond to these emotions, as opposed to having these emotions drive our responses and drive us into and through our advocacy and our activism. Our movements, you know, this particular movement we're talking about, veganism right now, and many movements for progressive social change are at risk of cannibalizing themselves because there isn't this emotional awareness work being done or, or what I call relational literacy, developing the understanding of an ability to practice healthy ways of relating to other humans, to other animals, of course, and to also to ourselves and our own emotions. So one of the most important things that we, any of us can do, I believe, and I, I talked about this a little bit in my talk, is to commit to developing this inner observer, to commit to developing our self-awareness, and we can all do it. It's just a matter of pausing, you can set your alarm and alarm to go off several times throughout the day. And you pause and take just one minute and just ask yourself, 
look inside. What am I feeling right now? What am I thinking right now? Don't judge it. Don't make up a story about it. Don't act on it. Just notice it. The more you do this, the better you will get at it and it will become automatic and you will have that part of you always watching and noticing and your self-awareness will grow such that you don't have to necessarily, you know, work at becoming joyful. You will just be able to be in more of a state of, of authenticity. So these moments of joy can move through you as you have joyful experiences and moments of sadness can move through you as you have sad experiences and you don't judge any of your emotions. You just allow them, allow them to be in you. And then you also develop the awareness that you need to realize what you need to do to take care of yourself so that you can stay in this movement and do this work for the long haul for the rest of your life without burning out, without becoming misanthropic, without finding somebody at, or some group in the world to hate on and to rage on without becoming perfectionistic and beating yourself up for not being good enough. We really need to work on our own self-awareness and our own relational literacy. And this, I believe, holds the key to us being able to not only bring about the kind of transformation that we want in the world, but to actually live and be that transformation ourselves. Well, Rupert, you've been quiet for an awful long time. So there's well, got to be a lot of pent up thoughts going on in your head. There, there are, but m most of them are, are just uh, profound agreement with what I've been hearing. I thought Melody expressed that very, very beautifully and, and powerfully. Uh, it's so important to understand that this is a marathon and not a sprint. It's so important to find multiple ways of trying to ensure ourselves uh, against uh, burnout. Um, and what I think is always so powerful in Melanie's approach is the way that she has this kind of um, psychological at attention to um, ourselves and to those we're trying to talk with. Uh, and I do think it's a, it's a much more pragmatically effective uh, approach than, than some other approaches which could be, could be named uh, in, the, in the vegan movement. Uh, I think it's a, an approach which is much less likely to to um, get people's backs up unnecessarily and so on. Um, I do want to, to say, by the way, as we were sort of touching on um, 20 minutes or so ago, that I do think it's really important that uh, the vegan and plant-based movements do not restrict themselves to, uh, to, to advocacy and to uh, voluntary change and education and so forth. Um, these movements do need to enter into the um, political uh, sphere, into the political space. Uh, and I think that Melanie's got a lot of um, good things to say about how you can communicate effectively uh, in that space. Um, as I was suggesting earlier, you know, if we're really going to turn this super tanker around, uh, we need to start getting um, governments to, to take uh, appropriate action local governments, state governments, national governments, etc. Uh, you might start on that with, with relatively soft ways uh, of doing it, such as, for example, um, you, could, you could make default options into plant-based options rather than non-plant-based options. So, you know, it wouldn't be that difficult for, for a government to say, okay, when, whenever we organize a, an event, um, all the food at that event is gonna be plant-based unless somebody asks uh, for an exception. Um, uh, you, could do that, uh, you could do that on planes. I mean, you know, hopefully there'll be less and less plane travel, but you know, how people have meals on planes. You could just make it the, the default that the meals on planes are, are plant-based and people have to ask in advance uh, if they want, uh, if they want a, a meat-based uh, meal. These would be some of the kind of easy ways in, I think, to seeing how political and governmental action could and should be taken on this issue because you know if we're going to have system level change and transformation in the kind of time we've got available uh, we need to be using those levers. Um, final point I'd like to, to make is going back to the, the this absolutely vital stuff about uh, finding uh, joy in in what we do uh, and and peace uh, uh, despite the, the, the horrific situations that we have to deal with. I want to just elaborate on, on a remark I made earlier about this, which is that these uh, various emotions that we, that we feel, um, uh, I profoundly believe that we need to feel them and we need to find ways of expressing them powerfully in the public domain. 
I mean um, terror and anguish and grief and, and rage and, and despair. Um, and that's been the, the secret of the success of, of Greta, and that's been the secret of the success of Extinction Rebellion insofar as it's been successful, as it, as it has been quite successful in my country. And when I've been you know, on, on TV uh, on the verge of breaking down to tears as I talk about my nephews and nieces and what I think about them and so on, you know, people in the old environmental movement didn't used to do that. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why the old environmental movement uh, didn't uh, make some of the changes that we've managed to make in the last few uh, years. But the crucial thing is, as I tried to say before, all of these emotions act, at the end of the day come from love, right? We grieve because of what's being done to what we love. We rage because of what's being done to what we love. Uh, we feel uh, terror because of the, the, the threat to, to what we love. And that's what one needs to do. One needs to always trace it back uh, to, to the love. And the love, of course, connects with, with, uh, with joy directly. And if you trace back the, these emotions to, to love, and if you do that among yourselves, and if you sometimes do that in public as well, um, I think that's incredibly, uh, incredibly powerful. We need to get these emotions, the, the so-called negative emotions and the really positive emotions more into the public space. We need to move beyond just being sort of cold, rational policy wonks and, and, and authentically enter into the public space. As Melanie was saying, authentic feeling of one's emotions is an absolutely vital part of being an effective activist or being an effective communicator, given the gravity of the situations we face in my belief. I just want to add, uh, I've always wondered why they served uh, roast beef and cheesecake at American Heart Association meetings. You know, it's not relevant now, but if we ever start having medical meetings again, or dietetic meetings that aren't sponsored by the dairy industry and the meat industry, we're ever going to have them again, then I think we should make those default. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, after all, but unfortunately, these, uh, unfortunately, the very foods that we're, we're condemning are the ones that bring patients into our offices. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was, um, you made, I mean, I agree with everything you said, Rupert, really, really excellent points. I mean, clearly uh, institutional change, systemic change ultimately is what's gonna push this needle forward as much as we need to, right? So that's absolutely, absolutely essential. Um, and um, to your point about bringing our emotions into the conversation, I love the way you framed that. And it, it made me think about how I think, and I don't know, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking about this now, but, but different forms of activism have, have, have used, and advocacy have used different levels of emotion. They like leverage emotions differently, right? So you have some forms of activism, which are almost entirely emotion-based and which can turn off the public because the public then uses this as an excuse to discredit the activists, you know, this, this whole stereotype of activists being overly emotional is a stereotype that first of all has been used throughout history to shoot the messenger, right? If you shoot the messenger, you don't have to take seriously the implications of their message, right? So they, you know, African, the, the slavery abolitionists were called, you know, sentimentalists and women who the suffragettes were also overly emotional or hysterical. Somebody who's too emotional by definition isn't rational enough and people who are not rational are not worth listening to. So we have some forms of activism are, are highly emotion-based and this is problematic some forms of activism are not, but nevertheless, the public perceives activists as too emotional because any emotion is too much because many people in the public don't want to be confronted with the emotions beneath the concerns that we're raising. And then you have people who err on the side of caution and take a totally rational approach as a way to try to bypass or offset this kind of criticism of, of activists being too emotional. I love what you're talking about, which is you know having as an authentic approach as possible, where we bring rationality into the conversation, obviously, and we're not afraid to show our emotions in these rational conversations. And I also think that we, you know, different forms of, of advocacy require different relationships with our emotions, right? So in some cases, you're gonna wanna be more rational and maybe hyper-rational um, than you are in others. 
And then there's the added dimension that we have to honor who we are and how we process and express emotions ourselves. So with the, our Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy, my, my organization Beyond Carnism runs SIVA. And one of the things that we do is we, we train vegan advocates around the world. And one of the conversations we often have is um, asking advocates to figure out what they're good at and focus on doing that and not try too hard to be something that they're not. So we have sometimes very emotional people who are trying to be like giving public talks at conferences where they have to be just too cerebral and it doesn't work for them. Um, so it's really, you encapsulated, I think this idea very well, which is focusing on authenticity rather and, and being as integrated as possible in your advocacy. No, yeah, I just, yeah. uh, I, I know, just to change the conversation, I, I noticed something on, um, on the chat board that kind of brought uh, the need for me to respond. And that is that somebody said at the uh, Adventist Hospital on Oahu, uh, they by fault serve vegetarian meals. Well, that Adventist Hospital most likely is Castle Hospital, where I worked when I was a young doctor, when I was in my 20s and 30s. And we tried to get uh, healthy meals there. And I think probably the work that uh, that I did and my wife Mary did with the Adventist hospitals in um, in Hawaii has made it so that the default meals are vegetarian meals. But I can tell you, I, I most recently worked at St. Lena Hospital, which is another Adventist hospital, and they're they're still serving. Well, the employees get vegetarian meals, but from the that floor up where the patients uh, reside they all get by default meat meals. And when I asked why, they said, because they have, to, they have to compete with Queen of the Valley Hospital, which is right down the road. So here you have a religion that's based on, on helping people through diet and lifestyle and specifically with a vegetarian diet. And they, and they compromise their basic religious beliefs for profit. And they tell me they can't keep the doors open if they were gonna serve vegetarian meals. But I was so glad to see that chat comment that um, Oahu, where I started working when, in my first, my first place as a, as a doctor back in the 1970s and 80s, Castle Hospital is probably the, the Adventist hospital you're talking about. So chances are happening, man. Absolutely. Slowly but surely. <laughs> there was a comment I saw earlier, um, not sure who about trauma-based emotions versus other emotions. And I just wanted to comment on that briefly, which is, um, you know, it, one thing that, that all of us could do, um, or many of us could do, I think that would go a long way is to reduce the amount of trauma that we're experiencing. And that in and of itself could be just a game changer for our own individual advocacy and sustainability, meaning <clears throat> not not exposing ourselves to traumatic imagery that's unnecessary for us to be exposed to and, and, and working with the traumatization that we've already had to the best of our ability. And I don't wanna take up more time on this, but I'm happy to come back to that later. But really, I just wanted to make this statement that simply reducing our exposure to an experience of trauma could really be a game changer for us with our ability to experience all of our emotions more healthfully and relate to others and ourselves more healthfully. I'd love to tag on to that. First of all, thank you so much. Trauma is a, a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart as well as a, um, a person who um, had experienced so much childhood trauma that I should be a, an alcoholic and uh, obese and have diabetes and heart disease and cancer and uh, be suicidal and et cetera, or be dead at 63. Um, according to the ACE study, um, the adult childhood, the adult, um, I forgot what it's called, but the ACE study, which is the largest comprehensive study that looks at the connection between childhood trauma and adult outcomes. And um, as someone who ran a center for adult survivors of child sexual abuse, um, this is a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart as well. And I, I just, I think that what the research shows is that there are particular populations who are susceptible and uh, positively susceptible to these images and, uh, and making positive change, primarily young people. If we, if we use these images of um, you know, factory farming and things like that, 
um, that there are some people that are going to get on the vegan bandwagon as animal rights activists, but for the vast majority of people, that is not helpful activism. And so I just, I just say here, here, uh, amen, Dr. Melanie. I, I just want to, um, you know, emphasize that, yeah, let's let's do what we can to reduce trauma. And part of that is being in community together, right? Part of it is creating these communities of like-minded people, making sure that we have enough support, you know, making sure that we don't feel like we're out, out there alone and that the world is, you know, like there's this whole world that we have to change because the world doesn't need changing. The consciousness that created the problems needs changing. And we can we can change our consciousness more easily when we're not traumatized and when we're gathering with other people who are supporting our journey and helping us to, um, to stay on track and be these integrated people who can honor all, all, all of our emotions without being engulfed by um, some of them. Yeah, yeah that's just... so well said. Go ahead, go ahead, Roberta. Well, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, could just to, to pick up what you've both been saying, I think it's absolutely right. And I think that the importance of community is, uh, is obviously crucial. That's one of the reasons why I think that we need, we need a genuine and pretty radical uh, relocalization so that we can actually build more genuine uh, community because it's fantastic to have events like this and to build you know virtual networks and so on. But at the end of the day, community has to be built with people where you live uh, and you need to get familiar with your own uh, backyard and we need to radically shorten those supply lines and so forth. If we do all of that and we build more genuine community, we're gonna have uh, a lot less vulnerability to trauma uh, in the first place. Um, and that also speaks to the uh, question in the Q&A by Joseph Gotsman, who says, relative to the economic situation, how are we to survive the economic ramifications from going to a, going to a more agrarian civilization with the numbers of people alive today? Um, uh, well, but that question makes the assumption that um, we can only support the uh, numbers of people alive today with something like the kind of agriculture that we have today. But that assumption is, is very contestable. Um, industrial uh, uh, agriculture is very effective at growing food with a small number of people employed, but it's not necessarily more effective than um, highly labor intensive forms of uh, agriculture in terms of yields uh, per hectare, uh, especially when you're talking about in the long term, because of course industrial agriculture mines the soil. Um, after uh, 40 or 50 years, you know, in, in large parts of the world, if we carry on as we are, there just wouldn't be any soil left. Uh, the American Midwest has lost vast amounts of its soil, as many of you probably know, and there's, there's real issues about sustainability of agriculture there on the current model for that reason. So what we actually need to do is move to a more agrarian civilization with more people working on the land in order to ensure that, uh, that we don't have, uh, that, that we minimize the risk of, uh, of starvation uh, in the future. That's one of the absolutely central things that we need to do. And it should start with making it easier for those who already want to go back to the land uh, to do so. You know, we make it really, really hard with our systems of agricultural subsidies and so forth. Um, and with our planning laws, we make it really hard for people to become small holders and small farmers. We don't make it easy for community supported agriculture, etc. You know, these are some of the absolute basic things that we should try to change in our neighborhoods and ultimately uh, nationally if we want to have a, a survivable and indeed enjoyable future. Okay, well, you know, I know this conversation could go on for hours and hours, and I, I really appreciate all three of you have brought a message of hope, solutions. I, I don't feel like we're doomed. I feel like what you're telling us is to reduce our impact on the planet, eat less meat, be more in touch with our emotions, not be afraid of them. Um, and, and if we do that, you know, I can't imagine what we could accomplish. I think I'm reading in the chat that a lot of these things are going to happen at a lower level. And I think conferences like this can can do that, can inspire people, bring people together, share different ideas and, and offer some hope. So I really appreciate that from all of you. It's a very difficult topic and it can be very depressing, but I think, you know, you all gave us a, a powerful message of hope. There is something that we can do, all of us, and it can start right now. So thank you all so much for this morning. It was great. Dad, any comments? Well, I was just going to say, we're going to get together this afternoon. Oh, I've got, first, I want to thank uh, all, all three of our guests and also the audience participation. But we have an afternoon plan for you, too, and we want you all to join in. We have a, a dietitian, one of the original researchers on uh, 
a, excuse me, a dietitian. We're going to be talking about the Marshall Islands. And we also have one of the original researchers who did uh, the scientific papers on, on the environment and on the effect of the livestock industry. And also another one of our speakers is going to talk about the reality of change. And uh, one of the questions I'm going to ask them, and I didn't have time to ask you folks, is what are we going to do with all the cows and sheep and chickens? I mean, there are billions of them that we're going to have to get rid of when we all become vegan. And from a medical doctor's point of view is, uh, you know, half the population on this planet has about 30 pounds on average to lose. That's three and a half billion people times 30 pounds. And that fat is made of carbon. And that carbon has got to be released someplace. Oh, we got so many problems we have to solve. But anyway, I hope you can join us this afternoon. Wonderful. Reverend Love, Rupert Reed, Melanie Joy, thank you so much for this morning. And, uh, you know, possibly we'll continue this conversation again in the future. So I appreciate all your time. Thank you everyone for being here. It was great reading all your comments in the chat. We've got a break until 1 p.m. Eastern time. And we'll be back. No, 1 p.m. Pacific time, Heather. 1 p.m. Pacific time. I don't yeah. know where I am. <laughs> and uh, we'll be meeting with our afternoon panelists. So thank you all for this morning. Thank you, Dr. McDougall, Dad. Thank you to our panelists. And uh, we'll see you back here in a little over two hours. Thank you so much. Thank Bye -bye. you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, That was uh, fun. Thank it was great, guys. Thanks a lot. Great conversation. We made a big difference. I, I'm sure of it. I, I know we're, we made a huge difference. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really press to make sure that your messages get out to the public. Thank you so much, Dr. McDougall. Really appreciate it. It was, it was, it was great. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it.